Good evening. Welcome to the Yorktown Central School District Board of Education meeting for March 18th, 2024. Can I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss matters pertaining to tenure, the employer employment history of particular pedagogical and non-pedagogical employees, matters made confidential under federal law, FERPA, and collective negotiations under Taylor Law for YAS and YCTCTA. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Can I have a motion to go back into public session? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now we can start. Good evening. Welcome to the Yorktown Central School District Board of Education meeting for March 18, 2024. Could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? and remain standing for a moment of silence for our armed forces and those are our community of lost loved ones, especially the father of Catalina Tyndall, the mother of Cheryl Dineo, and the grandmother of Alexandra Hames. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we're going to start with good news, Dr. Hatter. Yes, we are delighted to, good evening everyone, first of all, good evening. It's nice to see so many students here from our middle school. I apologize for us coming out a few minutes late. I know it's a Monday night and you all have plenty of homework to do and lots to do when you get home, so we appreciate your patience. We're, we're going to begin this evening with a really exciting presentation from our middle school. And to introduce the presentation, I'd like to invite Dr. Rupchand, middle school assistant principal, to the podium. Dr. Rupchand. Good evening. Mrs. Carbone, uh, board, excuse me, Ms. Carbone, uh, members of the board, Dr. Hatter and central administrators. I'm honored to be here tonight to present the good news from Mildred Strang Middle School. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Harwich for allowing me to present and the board and Dr. Hatter for their role in tonight's good news. The I grant, or the innovation grant, uh, approved by the board, allowed opportunity for the incredible teachers and staff in our district to come up with innovative and ingenious ideas for the betterment of our students. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Video, uh, the recipient of the I grant, along with some of our students uh, to share our good news. Mr. Video? Hello, Dr. Hatter, Ms. Carbone, everyone else. Um, since uh, at our first day of a uh, school meeting, Dr. Hatter announced that the district was going to fund I grants for teachers to do new and innovative projects with our students. I saw this as an opportunity to do something hands-on that most schools do in with simulations, and I've done the simulations for a lot of years. It's a process called gel electrophoresis, and it's taught to the students during the biotechnology unit um, section of the genetics unit. Um, this uh, process actually covers state standard high school uh, life science 3-2, and it's part of the New York State Lab Relationships and Biodiversity. In addition, interpreting the results of, of, of gel electrophoresis fulfills two of the um, science uh, and, and engineering practices. Once they understand the process, it's very easy for them to interpret the gel, to get their results, draw their conclusions based on what they're able to see. Um, there's always one, at least one question on the Regents exam, and there's usually uh, two or three that has to do with electrophoresis. Um, in addition, as I said, that test number six is part of the state lab um, where they use a simulated version and they cut the DNA and they line them all up. Um, when I teach them to do it, I usually do a virtual lab and then I'll do their, um, you know, they'll do their own little cut and paste lab, which is, this is somebody's results here, and um, what they will, you know, make their conclusions based on this. This, they were trying to figure out who robbed a jewelry store and they figured that out very well. Um, they, uh, this, uh, this, all of this is uh, enough for them to learn how to interpret their lab results and draw the conclusions, but actually doing something is always better. The iGrant enabled me to purchase two of these uh, mini one gel electrophoresis systems. Um, I was also able to buy the DNA samples that were needed for the lab. The systems are very user friendly. They only take 25 minutes to use the lab. The ones we used to use in the high school, the old ones would take like an hour, so like doing multiple ones in a day was impossible. All right. Um, in addition, this one is so high tech that I can use my cell phone to take pictures of the gel and put it right onto Google Classroom, which was very cool. 
Um, we were able to do the whole lab in a double period, which was absolutely perfect. The lab that we did was called Hunting the Inheritance of Huntington's Disease. The students acted as genetic counselors for a family of four whose father was just diagnosed with the disease. They had to start by researching and learn more about Huntington's, but I have talked enough, so I'm gonna introduce you to my amazing student volunteers that will tell you what they did during the lab. And we'll start with Hannah. Through our research, we learned that there is a gene on chromosome number four that codes for the production of the Huntington protein. There is a section of the gene that has the basis CAG repeated over and over again. We call this a trinucleotide repeat. Most people make normal Huntington protein and have from 10 to 35 repeats of these three bases. This is a variation in our DNA that does not affect us in any way. People with Huntington's disease, or HD, have between 40 through 120 of these CAG repeats. These additional codons add extra amino acids to the Huntington protein, which, causes us, which, ca which changes the protein shape, causing it to lose its function. The protein builds up in the brains of the people with HD, which becomes life-threatening. HD patients usually start showing symptoms in their 40s through 50s. Can I just ask if you talk right into the microphone because we really want to hear and it's hard otherwise. Thank you. Our research also showed us that we inherit the number of trinucleotide repeats in a hunting gene the same way we inherit alleles for any trait. If one parent is, if one parent is heterozygous for a trait, for example, they could pass down either a recessive or a dominant allele in the gametes. In the same way, if the mother has six repeats on one chromosome and 19 repeats on another, her eggs would contain one chromosome number four with either six or 19 CAG repeats. Inheritance of the, HD, of the HD allele, though, is a little different. Having more than 40 CAG repeats makes that section of the gene unstable. Because of this, when the chromosome is copied before reproduction, the enzymes can copy extra CAGs, even more than the parent with HD actually had. We had to be sure to notice that children with HD might have more repeats than their parents. As genetic counselors, we started by accessing information that was collected from Nathaniel's family. Nathaniel was the father in the family who was diagnosed with HD. We used the information to create a pedigree chart of who in the family had the disease. This is important to make sure that Huntington's disease is inherited through the family and not the result of a random mutation in Nathaniel. We focused on dates of birth and death, whether or not the individual showed symptoms of HD, the age of onset of the disease, that is when you first see symptoms, and their genotypes, the number of repeats, if that number is known. Once we finished the pedigree, we were dis uh, surprised to see that we could figure out a few things we did not realize at first. This is an example of a pedigree created by one of the groups. The blue circles and squares represent individuals that we believe suffered from Huntington's disease. Looking at the pedigree, we can conclude that it is an inherited disease. We can see that it is dominant because it appears in every generation and that it is not autosomal, not sex-linked. That it is autosomal, not sex-linked. We know that because one father passes it to his son, we were also able to show a correlation between the number of repeats in the HD allele and the age of onset. Someone with more repeats will start to show symptoms at a younger age. For example, Nathaniel was found to have 72 repeats and started to show symptoms at 33, while his mother Anne showed symptoms at 39 with her 64 repeats. The pedigree showed that we sh should move forward to see if there is a chance of the twins inheriting the HD allele. For our next step in the genetic counseling process, we wanted to predict the probability that the twins could each inherit the HD allele from their father. To do this, we made a Punnett square of the genotypes of their parents, Nathaniel and Jean. The numbers you see are the number of bases in the section of the DNA Huntington gene that we copied. The HD allele that Nathaniel carried had 330 bases. If that allele is inherited by either child, he or she will inherit Huntington's disease. In the Punnett square, the red arrows point to the two possible genotypes of the four that will result 
in HD. That means there is a 50% chance that each twin will have Huntington's disease. Now it's time to test the chromosomes of the children to find out their genotypes. The DNA samples that we received were many copies of the same section of the Huntington gene. We had DNA from each person in the family, Jean the mom, Nathaniel the dad, and the twins Peter and Kim. We used the process of gel electrophoresis to, discern, to determine the genotypes. First, we made a gel out of heated agarose that we allowed to cool just like jello. We placed the gel into the electrophoresis chamber and inserted the samples in the wells of the gels. We had to make sure that we recorded the wells where we put each sample. The tool we used to transfer the samples is a micropipette. The one in the picture is holding 10 microliters of the DNA sample in its tip. That is the volume of DNA we put in each well. Gel electrophoresis works by passing an electrical current through the chamber with the gel and DNA samples inside. Because DNA carries a negative charge, it will move through the gel to the positive side. Smaller samples, the ones with less bases, will travel farthest than larger ones. The DNA samples will show up as bands. These bands will line up in a line for each person under the well where we put the sample. This mini one electrophoresis chamber had a light we were able to leave on and an am amber top that allowed us to see the gel during the whole experiment. We were able to walk up throughout the period and see the DNA bands moving through the gel. While the gel electrophoresis was running for about 25 minutes, we used the punish square we had made earlier to predict what the banding pattern would look like for the two parents and each of the four possible outcomes. You could see how noticeable that the HD allele appears in the prediction. The extra repeats in the HD allele create a longer copy of the gene. Remember that larger DNA fragments, those with more bases, move less far than the smaller ones. Notice how there are two bands for each parent and each outcome. The two bands show that most of the time, there are two different numbers of repeats on the pair of chromosomes. But in outcome four, we see only one band. It is not because that the outcome only accounts for one chromosome. Instead, there are the same number of repeats on both chromosomes. So all of the fragments are the same size, making just one band. This is a picture of the gel we made through gel electrophoresis of the family's DNA samples. We can see that Jean and Nathaniel's banding patterns are similar to our predictions. Jean has the genotype 138 to 171, and Nathaniel was 171, 330. And Kim has one band similar to outcome four, so she must have the genotype 171 to 171 according to our Punnett square. Peter has one normal Huntington allele, 171, and a second that appears to be an HD allele. It has even more bases than his father because it did not move as far. Using the standard on the left of the gel, we can estimate that this pa uh, band is about 450 bases. That would be approximately 114 C CAG repeats. Based on everything we have learned, we can conclude that Peter will develop Huntington's disease and will most likely show symptoms in his mid-20s. Although we understood the process of gel electrophoresis after completing the virtual and cutout labs, it was amazing to see the actual gel and to carry out the process. The chamber was very easy to use and it was easy to, to, for us to see the results. In this lab, we were really scientists. We collaborated in small groups throughout the lab and began by doing research to learn about the disease. We used what we learned about Nathaniel's family to make predictions about the probability of his children inheriting the disease. We asked many questions for each other as we worked through the calculations of converting between the fragment size and the number of CAG repeats. We used the bands we saw in the gel as our evidence as we drew our conclusions, and the best part was that we were able to solve the problem that people face in real life. 
Thank you for listening to our presentation tonight, and thank you for giving the teachers the opportunity to apply for these I grants so we could do as mu do we can do so much interesting things. Now for the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy there isn't a test at the end of this. I'm still trying to figure out how to spell electrophoresis. That's, I have to tell you, I am blown away, absolutely blown away. This is remarkable learning that's happening in your classes. To our students, so proud of you for so many reasons. I'm so proud of you, but this is not easy stuff. This is really complex stuff. This is high school stuff. And in fact, your uh, principal at some point Mr. De Janeiro is here to see what you've learned, and, and that's terrific for you to make that connection this way. Mr. Vetti, I just want to thank you because somebody who's at the pinnacle of her career, who has accomplished so much in the classroom, you didn't need to do anything differently. Everything you've done has been so successful, and, and you've done some great things in the classroom for students. And you, you took a risk. You applied for the grant, you, and... You stepped out of maybe your comfort zone to try to learn something new that you thought would benefit your students, and I really appreciate you doing that because without educators like you, opportunities like this don't happen. So thank you for applying. Thank you for bringing this to our schools. Students, did you have fun with this? Okay. As fun as electrophoresis can be, I guess. That's what it sounds like. I am just so proud of you. Keep up the great work. What you did here is remarkable. The fact that you can make this prediction and then specify the point in this person's life when symptoms would appear initially, I think is remarkable. And this is some really high level stuff. And I hope you keep that passion for science because the world needs great scientists. So I hope you continue that passion, carry it into the high school when you get over to Yorktown High School. Maybe you get into our science research program and you take some really great science courses that we offer. But I hope that the passion that you shared with us tonight never goes away because that was really, really impressive. Parents in the audience, thank you so much for sharing your children with us. You give us great children to work with. We appreciate the time that we have with them and, and teachers like Mr. Vedio and their other teachers certainly take advantage of all of these learning opportunities that we have. And we just, we're so thankful for your partnership, your support. And then just finally, Mrs. Horowitz, uh, Ms. Copeland, Dr. Rupchand, this doesn't happen without your leadership, and I certainly appreciate all that you have done to continue to cultivate innovation within the school building. So thank you all. I'm just so proud of you. Well done. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to let the, the board speak, but Mr. Video, this wasn't a middle school lesson. <laughs> it was amazing to see what they can do. Really incredible. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Lisa, you want to start? <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, that was middle school. Well, like, I had I had to go back. I have the slides here on my computer. I had to go back and reread the beginning so I could keep up with you guys. It's amazing, Mr. Video. Thank you so much for doing this, kids. Thank you so much for participating and and sharing it with us. I'm just I'm blown away. Yeah, this was quite a presentation. Uh, I look. I actually had to go back to the beginning slides <laughs> to really pull it together once again and figure out exactly how many different parameters you hit. And it was statistics, probability, science, engineering, and then making and defending a claim. Talk about just pulling so many subject areas together into one lesson. That was simply amazing. That's even more than E-STEAM pulls together. This <laughs> went above and beyond the acronym of E-STEAM. So this was amazing, and you should really feel good about where you're headed. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Rashmi. Great job by our students. And uh, Mr. Berrio, thank you for you know, applying for the I grant, but also encouraging our students, um, you know, to uh, to pursue their interests. And to Dr. Hatter, I, I have to say, you bring out the best from our amazing staff. Um, you started the I grant initiative this year, and we have already seen, I think we saw two or three other ones. Um, I see them also in the newsletters. I mean, you know, kudos to you for thinking about it and for finding the money. <laughs> um, and for, you know, encouraging our staff. So thank you. Mike? There's not much I can add to all of that, <laughs> all of what was said, but it, I was truly amazed. Um, great presentation. Thank you all for participating, and thank you for offering this opportunity to, to our students. It's really a, truly remarkable to see. Kathleen? 
Thank you, Mr. Trivedi. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Such an innovative teacher and, you know, making this hands-on, you could have touched another student that, you know, really wanted to learn science but needed that hands-on. So thank you. And everybody did a great job presenting. I think I said it all. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are amazing. So So we're going to just take a brief five-minute recess. So if there are homework assignments that need to get done, you, you'll have the opportunity to head home now. You're welcome to stay. We have two budget presentations that are part of this evening. But if you'd like to depart for the evening, have a great night. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll just take a brief five-minute intermission for you to head to the exits if you choose. So Ron, I just have to, to tell you that why, this presentation brought back memories of when science research used to come and present. That's what it looked like. Some of these, they, they did a phenomenal job. So, absolutely true. Great job. Great job. So, uh, we'll, we'll, public comments. okay, yeah. Did anybody sign up? Nope. Okay, so we'll go right back to you, Ron. Okay, so we're going to pivot now from one great presentation to another presentation. Uh, we're going to, if it's okay with with the board, what we'd like to do is deliver the two presentations separately, and we'd like to do that because we know that so many members of our community view the presentations after the fact, whether it's through a Board of Education meet meeting video or they go to our website. So what we'd like to do, and, and Brian will, will certainly be able to post this to the website, is deliver the athletics and co-curricular, have a Q&A session on that portion of the budget. This way we can cut that video, post that independently to our website so members of the community can interact with this presentation and the questions that followed. And then we'll present our instruction and technology and PPS budget and have a question and answer on that as well. And, and again, post those separately to our website so members of the community who have an interest in one or the other can go directly to the website, hear the presentation, hear the questions that are asked and answered with regard to the presentation and just have that in one spot rather than delivering both presentations and having a, a more jumbled Q&A session toward the end. But certainly, just because you don't ask questions, if a question occurs to you after the first presentation and while we're in the second, you're certainly welcome to ask it at that point. But at this time, we're going to continue with our series of budget presentations. This evening, as I mentioned, we'll be delivering two presentations. The first is on athletics and co-curricular activities in the district. That will, again, will be posted to our website shortly. You'll have the presentation as well as the voiceover, the narrative that comes along with this presentation posted to our website. So we certainly encourage members of the community to go visit our website to access not only the presentations delivered this evening, but any of the presentations in the series of presentations that have been delivered to this point. And the process culminates next week with my final presentation to the board of what's referred to as the superintendent's budget. The board then will deliberate We'll review that budget, we'll review the proposals in the budget, and then make amendments as needed. And that would lead to the adoption of the budget on April 15th. So we encourage the community to stay engaged. We'd love for you to come out to our meeting on Monday the 25th. We'll send out an e-blast reminder later this week to remind our community of the upcoming meeting Monday night with the presentation of our um, proposed budget. But Without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our Assistant Superintendent for Business, Ms. Lisa Sanfilippo, who will begin with the Athletics and Co-Curricular Budget Presentation. Hi, good evening. So tonight, we're going to be talking about athletics and co-curricular activities. That's what we're going to be uh, presenting. I just wanted to point out that uh, we have some people here to help answer your questions. Our Director of Athletics, Mr. Rob Barrett, our high school principal, Mr. Joe DiGennaro, and our middle school principal, Ms. Marie Horowitz, are here. It's just a picture of some of our athletes doing what they love to do. This is an overview of our athletics department, and it starts with the Director of Athletics, Physical Education, and Health. Reporting to him is uh, his clerical staff, the coaches, athletic trainers, and seasonal coordinators. Overall, for the department, um, in terms of FTEs, there's one athletic director. There are 
three various seasonal coordinators. Um, we're representing it as a 0.3 FTE, but it is an after school stipend, and there's one, um, one coordinator per season. There's an administrative assistant, a 1.0. Um, currently, we have an athletic trainer slash we're hiring for a um, strength and conditioning coach that was included in this budget for this year at a 1.5. Um, and overall coaches are 77. This is a breakdown of the number of teams, coaches, and students by season. I just want to point out that the spring season numbers that are here are numbers from last spring season because we just started off on the spring season this year. So for fall sports, we have 23 teams, 32 coaches, and 397 students. Winter sports, 26 teams, 22 coaches, and 245 students. Spring sports, 20 teams, 23 coaches, 383 students, a total of 69 teams, 77 coaches, and 1,025 students participating in athletics. So this is just a breakdown of the teams and the various levels by season. I won't read everything to you. We will have it up on the website for, uh, for you all to take a look for yourselves. Added for this year was a girls flag football team and a boys JV volleyball team. The, volley, the JV volleyball team did not gather enough interest this year, so it did not run. Um, but we will keep it in the budget for next year in case the interest uh, re re resumes. This is the uh, fall sports participation. This is broken down by each team. It identifies the number of teams, number of coaches, number of athletes. And this highlights the, um, the number of trips that the uh, teams take and the estimated or approximate um, associated cost of those trips. This is the winter sports breakdown as well. It shows the same information, teams, coaches, athletes, number of trips, and the cost of the trips. Again, the spring sports participation, I want to um, emphasize that this represents last spring, not the current spring, and the far column is the estimated cost of the uh, trips for, for those specific teams. Again, this will all be up on the website. So we wanted to recognize some of our student athletes who have done wonderful things over the past year. This past fall, we had one student um, get achieve the Golden Dozen um, accolade. We had one student uh, achieve a Class A North Lineman of the Year award. Uh, this past winter, winter, we had two teams reach the league championships, two teams win the section championships. We had one coach as coach of the year. We had one student in our Low HUD Super 7. And last spring, we had two teams also win league championships, two teams win section championships, one student All-American, and one student player of the year. So these are some very high honors for our student athletes. So this page shows um, the athletic budget summary. It shows our current proposed budget for this year, our budget that was adopted last year, the dollar change and the percentage change. And it's broken out in a pie format so you can see the allocation. Uh, obviously, our salaries, which are coaches' stipends, um, as well as our director salaries and office salaries, uh, make up the biggest percentage of this budget. Um, the increase here uh, is also because of the half Point five of the strength and conditioning coach. Last year we only put in a point five, so this year we have to add the other point five. And also in this budget is, which we'll be talking about a little bit further, um, is the proposed addition of three modified sports teams. So those amounts are in this budget as of the moment. So some of the new items for athletics that we wanted to discuss, huddle, is um, going to be added for girls softball and boys baseball teams. We will be changing, hopefully, from family ID to final forms. It's a program that families can use to register students for sports. 
We are looking to purchase some new equipment, high jump mats, hurdles, soccer goals, a three-man sled, football headphones, and field hockey goals if we do move forward with the modified girls hockey team. So the three sports that were included in the budget right now are girls field hockey team for approximately $20,000. That's all inclusive. That includes coaches, supplies, equipment, transportation, officials, that's everything. Boys volleyball at the modified level would cost approximately $13,000 all in and cross country boys and girls would cost approximately 20,000 all in. So let's move on to co-curricular. Here's some recent pictures of some of our clubs. So this slide is gonna show you all of our high school clubs and the current enrollment in each club. And again, I apologize for the size, but we wanted to get everything on there. It will be on online. The next slide shows the middle school clubs, the ones that are running in their enrollment as well. Some of the clubs that were piloted at the high school this year are the Cornhole Club, the Fashion Magazine Club, Forensics Club, MedLife Organization Chapter, Social Studies Honor Society, and Workload Organized Clubs. If these clubs are successful, they will run again next year. Some clubs not running in the high school this year were the Enrichment Club, the Film Club, Sharing Our Strength, the Songwriters Club. At the middle school, the Academic Triathlon, the Adobe Photoshop Club, the First Lego League, and the Pep Club. This is the budget summary of the co-curricular area in the budget. Again, um, the, one of the largest parts of the budget is salaries that are for the uh, advisor stipends. The increases in contractual expenses and supplies is mostly due to an increase in the um, funding for the Aeronautics Club, Science Research, and Science Olympiad. Um, we've invested significant funds for this year into those three clubs. And this last slide just is the remaining schedule for the budget presentations. As Dr. Hatter said, he will be presenting next week and budget adoption April 15th, budget hearing May 13th, and budget vote on May 21st. So that's it. So you wanna bring everybody up to the table? So if I can invite, so thank you, Ms. Amphilippo, for that presentation, uh, clear, comprehensive, and I, I appreciate the detail provided. What we'll do is we'll invite Mr. Barrett, our athletic director and director of PE Health, as well, along with Mr. DeGenero, high school principal, and Ms. Horowitz, middle school principal, to the day is here, and, and we're happy to engage in, in qu questions and answers, and hopefully a good discussion on the elements of the budget. Okay. Um, first of all, Lisa, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, do you want to start, Lisa? Do you want to start questions? Sure. Um, how did we select the sports for modified sports, and um, if there wasn't enough interest in JV boys volleyball, volleyball, why do we think there's going to be an interest in modified sports? Is this on? No. no. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, great question. So um, the sports that we selected are sports that aren't really taken care of at the YAC or the youth level. So we wanted to um, kind of build those programs. There are some of our weaker programs in a sense, although field hockey's been doing great of late, um, which has been awesome. Um, but we felt that if we we're gonna do something, we, we, we could build something in sports that are kind of not getting that feeder system. So, um, so that's how it was kind of selected. The idea behind volleyball was that we want kids to come to JV, so we're not getting them, let's try and attack the middle school with the idea that we'll get that seventh and eighth grade group then we'll have a JV group, and we already are having a varsity group at this point. Um, I was shocked that we didn't have a JV this year, considering the fact that we had to cut, unfortunately cut nine or 10 kids the previous year. Um, after reaching out to those kids and hoping that other um, students would be coming, um, it just didn't kind of happen, um, unfortunately. The coaches have also regained plan themselves, and they're doing clinics here in the spring in an effort to garner, garner some interest. Um, so we're hoping kind of attacking it from multiple angles that we're going to be able to 
build that program up um, as well as, you know, kind of take that last step for field hockey. Um, the coach has done a really nice job of doing those off-season kind of things. Um, but now we're trying to get, st you know, sticks in the kids' hands earlier so that there's maybe an interest um, at an earlier time where they can develop those skills and then come and it'll just add to the success of the program and what the coach has been able to accomplish over the last couple of years. Cheryl? Another question for Mr. Barrett. Uh, we just completed tryouts for the spring season. Uh, what were the results of our pioneer year for fl uh, girls flag football? How did that go? So I, w I wish they were like J I wish they were a little like JV volleyball in some sense that there'd be less because we did end up cutting quite a few kids, unfortunately. Um, the interest level at first was, I want to say it was in the 60s, almost 70. Um, so they were doing preseason kind of clinics just to kind of see where the girls' levels were at, see what their interest level was at. Um, over time, that number did drop. Um, you know, I think some saw it's a little more serious than, than um, they may have thought, um, a little harder than they may have thought. Um, and then ultimately, we had 38, I believe was the number, actually register, um, and we were able to keep 22. Um, so the idea was going in, as we looked, talked to other schools, um, the num magic number was 16. Um, but coach was like, it's the first year I really want to keep more, and I'm certainly encouraging that idea. We don't want to turn kids away. Um, so he went to 22, which he thought was a, a manageable number still. Um, did have conversations with um, some of the kids because some of them are younger, and you could see the potential, but maybe they're not quite ready to step on the field at this point. So they had those conversations about development versus playing time already, which I think are important conversations to have so that student athletes know what they're getting into. Um, but the number is 22. They had their first scrimmage today, and it was uh, pretty fun to watch. Yeah. I'm going to say that I saw a very excited group of young ladies, yeah. which was awesome. So it's great. Sure. And oh. thank you, by the way. That doesn't happen unless you guys do what you guys do. So I appreciate that. Freshman. Um, so my question is for uh, Mr. DiGennaro. Uh, so the clubs in the high school, uh, and Mrs. Horowitz too, so uh, the clubs that are uh, in pilot mode, uh, uh, do you decide to continue with that? Like, do, do you evaluate that in a year or two? And is it based on interest? Is it based on availability of an advisor? How do you uh, make that decision? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> we. Mid-year, we do a checkpoint with our advisors to see what the numbers look like, and then we do the same thing at the end of the year. So the goal of any piloted club is to make sure it has sustainability. A lot of times when those clubs are piloted, they're not seniors necessarily. They're younger kids who are going to be back and know that we want to try to get, you know, started but keep it going. Um, so yeah, we'll look at it again at the end of the year. We'll come back at the beginning of next year at our grade level assemblies. We'll talk about opportunities for kids to get connected to the high school, um, and then we go from there. So some of the clubs that you see on one of the other slides that didn't make it, it's the same process, but the other way around. Didn't have the interest. Um, so the great thing about it, and I, I echo what Mr. Barrett said, I, I appreciate all that all of you at the dais do to support all the athletics and the clubs to give the kids the opportunities. All the clubs that we have come from our students and their passions that they have. Great. And um, I also have a suggestion. Uh, I know this year we uh, switched up the order uh, of the presentations a little bit from what we have done. And I think the order is great. If I could only suggest moving up the instruction, uh, the general and the special ed, kind of starting with that, maybe right after the tax gap and the state aid, um, and then kind of you know working our way uh, with, with what we got. That would be great. Thank you. Mike? Catalina? With such a high interest in the girls' flag football, I think. Like, have me in the microphone. Um, is there, do other districts have a JV girls' flag football? Is that something that's, because I know it's piloting and everything is new. So, so currently there are no JV, because the thought was maybe we could kind of do something on, on the spur of the moment. Um, as difficult as that may be with uniforms and schedules and things like that, it was something that we made a couple calls, but there are no JV teams right now. Um, I do think that it is something that will be happening in the near future as um, the stories start to, well, one, it starts to get bigger and the stories of cutting kids 
um, starts to happen again, you know. Um, so yes, I, I'm hoping that that will happen. But there, as I talk to many schools, there's no thought yet, but they do think that it'll lead in the next year, two years, maybe three years. Okay. Um, I have a question about skiing's travel. It is through the roof. Why? So, so you got a couple hours because that's a difficult question. <laughs> what are you going to do to I cut would, it? Maybe that's a better question. <laughs> I, well, you know, um, <laughs> so there's there's the the travel with ski is 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 a um, major component of ski. So um, often they're traveling two hours, an hour and a half, two hours. Um, to the places where they can ski. So if it was snowing all the time, they would be traveling to closer places. But early on in the, it's certainly early on in the season and kind of the middle of the season, they're traveling to these places. Some of that um, is that a necessity because Thunder Ridge doesn't have the course, meet the course requirements that they need to run certain races. So they need practice on those bigger mountains. Um, so that's also a part of it. Um, and then also the equipment piece is a part of it. Um, and then the last part is we did look at entertaining having them go on school buses, um, but getting the buses at the times that we need them to get there and the time that it took to get there you have a certain minimum of hours that you have within your bus and then you start to pay overtime. And we started to realize that it was kind of becoming a wash. So we went with the um, coach buses because there's a lot of advantages. They can put their equipment underneath. Obviously they're, they're more comfortable for those long rides that are occurring. Um, but at the end of the day, because they were similar in price, that's why we chose them. So there is no easy way around it in terms of the cost for traveling. Um, you know, we do have 20 plus kids that were on this year's team. Um, it had, my understanding, even before I was here, was a long-standing tradition that ski was, you know, part of the community and the culture. Um, so it still has maintained itself. Um, you know, I did hear stories of two and three buses at one point going to to the mountains. I mean, I don't think we're at that level right now, but um, certainly it's kind of held on um, at this point. So you're saying you can't reduce it. <laughs> I can't what? You can't reduce that number. I've, we tried. We okay. did try to. Okay. Yeah. I, I, and and again, we're you know we're we're trying to give a, find a balance between giving them a good experience um, in terms of getting out there on the on the cor on the courses on the slopes, and then practicing dry land. You know, we're trying to find that balance. So they do a lot of dry land early because. There is no snow, um, and then when the snow comes, we try to take advantage of it as we can. Okay. Yeah, can I just follow up on that? Um, not picking on skiing, but there's 21 kids. How many people does a coach bus hold? Could we combine with another nearby school and go together? Sure, that's something we could certainly look at. Schools, um, some of the schools are bigger. We have kind of have kind of looked at it, but not looked at it as closely. I can certainly do that. Um, we already have a student from Lakeland who has joined us. Um, she skis unattached, which means she's part of the team, but she's not part of the team. She goes to all of our match or our competitions, um, but she skis independently with us. So they're, they're offsetting some of that cost. She's, you know, we, we charge them for their, their share. Um, so it's one 23rd or whatever it is of the cost. Um, so they obviously would be a logical um, partner, but they have only one skier that's interested. Um, some other schools have no interest in skiing uh, because nobody's come forward and wanted to ski. And then some of the other teams do have bigger teams that maybe would benefit from that. I, you know, I could certainly reach out to them. That's a great idea. Um, the other question I had about the the sports participation is the number of trips. Those aren't like trips. Those are to go to games, right? Like they're going to Somers. That's a trip. Right. They're going to Maypack. That's a trip. One hundred percent. But the bus still there's still a cost associated with every one of those. Right. Trips. But I don't yeah. want um, people to think we're sending the basketball team on twenty one trips yes. to <laughs> Disney World to play at ESPN. Yes. They're going to Maypack. You are right. Them, right. Yes. No. We're not Kentucky. No. <laughs> Cheryl, do you have anything else? I'm set. Thank you. Freshman. Mike, Catalina? I have one other question about the huddle software. You're putting it in for baseball. So that's something that is stationary at the field? 
Correct. So for both uh, softball and baseball, it'll be behind the basically home plate right. and show an out view, an outer view of the whole entire field, um, similar to what you see in the right. in the in the gym. It, you know, it's stationary. It follows it, the, the one in the gym follows a little bit, but for baseball, it's kind of a set camera right. for the entire. So softball, I understand, but baseball, my understanding is. We don't play a lot of games on that field because it's always flooded. So why are we investing in software for a flooded field that the kids aren't playing on all the time? So, great question. You are on top of your game. I love it. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's portable. So it doesn't matter where we play. We can, we can put that, um, you know, basically mount it wherever we show up. Because it's, it's all done through iPads and, and things like that. So we can place it behind, um, behind home plate up at Grand Knolls if that's where we're playing okay. or, or here at the high school, uh, you know, where we're playing. So and we it, take it with us when we... We take it with us, yep. yep. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I have another question. Go ahead. Um, this is for Ms. Sanfilippo. Um, the equipment increase for the athletics budget is 62%. Why is it so high? So we can probably both answer yes, this, absolutely. but um, it does include the cost of field hockey goals, which is new for modified. That's one of them. Um, the other one was the three-man sled. I don't know if the, uh, Mr. Sure. Mr. So we had that in our budget for this particular year, um, and unfortunately they were out of stock. So, um, and then we had a, uh, a purchase of uh, cheerleading mats that be became a requirement. So we did utilize that money just in a different way, unfor uh, unfortunately, um, but fortunately for the cheerleaders. Um, so, um, so we were just putting it back in for that purpose. Um, you know, so again, it'll be a one-time purchase, hopefully, you know, as long as it lasts. Um, some of the additional things that are in there, I will say that I have a, a track coach who asks for nothing, essentially, you know. Um, he is just old school, I can do with. Um, but we had a conversation about some of the things that you see that are on there, and, and, I'm, and I'm asking him questions, and he's like, no, we can make do, we can make do. And I'm saying, but, you know, we're refixing those, you know, and, and that's just his personality, which I appreciate. Um, but some of those things are, are long overdue. Um, the, the high jump mat and is, you know, coming up on 10 plus years, you know, and then the uh, hurdles, like I said, have been repaired over and over again. And again, we'll use the ones that we have until they're not, but um, we, we do need to start replacing um, them just because they're, they've met their life expectancy. Anybody else? Can I ask another question? Of course you can. Okay. <laughs> the modified sports, um, will kids be cut from those teams or are you taking everyone who plays? So that's, you know, that's, that, that was part of the conversation um, that we had several months ago now, um, you know, is yes, there, there is always potential for cuts. Anytime that you have teams, um, there is potential. My hope is that cross country will not be one of those because they tend to, you know, want to do it. We, we, the, even the high school number is big. Um, so I'm hoping that there won't be there, but you know, if 200 kids come out, the, the reality is that that could be the case, you know, um, for boys volleyball, again, it's new, so we're not sure if we'll have 11 or 25. Um, but I always do think that there'll be more than there than we expect, and and unfortunately, that's that's a reality um, with with any sports. We will try at the modified level to keep as as many as we can um, in a sense, but it also has to be manageable, you know, in, in tight spaces like the gym. Um, you know, or a little tighter spaces, so you have to kind of be mindful of safety as well. All right. I mean, I just think back to the conversation we had when you were here when we first discussed it and how, how you thought that the modified sports could actually be a deterrent to kids from playing high school because they get cut in the seventh or eighth grade and then don't try again when they get to high school. So I'm wondering how we're reconciling that with adding three modified teams where kids might get cut. Yeah, I, I'm not sure you can reconcile that. I'm going to be all, all, honest, all honesty and fairness to, to people who are watching and, and thinking about it. Um, we'll, we will certainly do our best to do it. Um, I do think that field hockey is, you know, a specialty kind of thing. It's not, you know, one of your mainstream popular, super popular sports that you see on TV all the time and those types of things. So I think kids that gravitate towards that hopefully will – kind of stay in it and be interested in it and stay in it for the long haul. I think boys volleyball is kind of in that category right now because it's so new. Um, so I'm hoping that 
we won't have to. You know, it, it hurts. You know, if, ask Mike Resigno. <laughs> He's never had to cut a kid because he did boys football and they carry big rosters. Um, I think it was the hardest thing he, he, you know, he would say it was probably one of the hardest things he's ever had to do, um, being a PE teacher in the building and knowing the students at a different way. Now you're kind of telling them they can't be part of something that's new. It's, it's you know, it's heartbreaking at times. So it's something we try not to do, but... You know, it's unfortunate. It's part of the, the, the deal with athletics, unfortunately. And, and Rob and I discussed the sports because <clears throat> it was something that both of us struggled with, this concept of cuts at such an early level. But I believe we were strategic in which sports are being recommended for, for, for next year. These aren't the more popular sports. There aren't the basketballs and the lacrosses and the footballs that would carry high levels of student tryout, high costs associated with them. These are <coughs> programs where if you play field hockey in this town, there aren't any options for you at the youth level. So we go from having nothing for a child to possibly an outlet, an avenue. Same thing with boys volleyball. We demonstrated that the JV team this year wasn't feasible to carry because there just wasn't enough interest because again, boys volleyball has such limited opportunities in the community. And so we're hoping that we can garner interest from some of the more popular sports to gravitate toward field hockey, volleyball. Cuts are always a possibility. I think we made, I'll say it, some unpopular choices in the sports that we selected because they aren't the highly participated sports. We're trying to build an athletic program here and it starts with creating feeder programs where they don't exist. But cross country was strategic because we are hoping to carry a, a large roster when it comes to cross country so that there can be that level of student participation without the fear of cuts. And I, and I don't believe we cut students off of cross country assuming they go to practice, correct? Correct. So that's, that's generally the, the approach that we've taken. Can I make sure? Yeah, I have one more question. Uh, Rob, actually you just uh, brought it up. So if we have no cuts for boys football, why do we have cuts for girls flag football? That's a great question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, sure there's a reason. I'm sure you have. A no, no, I mean, I want to. I hate to say this phrase, but that's the way. Every you know, when we reach out again, it's new to us. We've reached out to so many schools. They say magic number. Um, you know, of, of participants. You know, again, football is a little different because you have. Special teams, you have offense players, defensive players. You may have some of those playing both. Um, football, flag football, seven seven student athletes versus eleven, and some of those special team things don't happen um, from what I gather. Again, I'm still learning this sport right, myself, right. Um, so there's less opportunity for more kids to play. Mm -hmm. um, so that that becomes kind of the issue, you know. And then mm -hmm. how do you manage, you know, having so if you have 45 kids on your football team and 35 of them play or 40 of them play in some shape or form, um, you know, it's it, you're managing five to 10 kids who might not play and how do you handle that? Whereas if you have seven to, you know, say 11, now you're managing 11 right. other kids, you know, not right. playing. So yeah, it makes sense. Um, okay. So it, it becomes, yeah, just yeah. how do you manage it? It doesn't mean that it might not happen, and, but again, we just reached out to other schools who had had it um, and kind of asked for the recommendations. And well, there's a again, we've already exceeded those recommendations because right. they've recommended 16 and we've so, gone with 22. Yeah. So. But there's a difference in the num number of players who are playing on right. the field at a time. So yeah. that would, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. thank you. I didn't realize that. Thank you. Um, I have a question on the uh, cost uh, that are listed for the modified sports. Are those all inclusive? Like it includes uh, transportation too? Yes, those were the estimated about everything all in. Right. So, I mean, let's take uh, cross country. Uh, so, is that based? I mean, I, I would think in order to come up with the estim estimate, we as guess there would be a, uh, like a bus or two buses or so, something like that. So, there is a cap on the numbers, or are we expecting those numbers to go up? Like how? We we estimated two buses, <laughs> so that would be. Um, what is the total? 80, 88. 80, 88 students. Well, 86 students and one coach each. Right. So 88 seats, but 86 yeah. 
as an athlete. Um, I had cross country in my previous school. It was very yeah. popular, and that's where we were, give or take, um, on a given year between one and two buses. We didn't quite fill up two, but we didn't. Uh, we needed more than one. So yeah. that's that's um, where we were. I kind of went with that idea okay. um, of the popularity of it. Yep. Okay. That number does usually decrease a little bit when they realize how much running is involved in <laughs> cross country. <laughs> <laughs> What did they think it was? Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to know that you're to, to think you're running, but when you're actually running, that becomes another thing. So. You can't make that up. Anybody else? I just Go have ahead, one Kevin. question. Um, so if JV boys volleyball doesn't run, where does the salary get allocated? Can you possibly then, if you have 70 girls trying out for flag football, or I guess if any sport does not run, where does the salary get allocated? Um, that's usually a conversation that kind of yeah. happens in the in, uh, when we see things that arise. Um, so um, this particular year, because the sport is so new, we allocated the JV salary to an assistant. Essentially, we just we had hired a JV coach um, with the idea that there would be a team. So we we had them uh, him uh, help with our varsity coach um, for this particular season um, in an effort to try and make that program more popular. The going forward. He's going to be part of those those uh, clinics that we're talking about that are happening in the spring. So hopefully, he's his interest is getting kids to be involved. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that that will happen. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So at this time, we're oh, going to you're coming back <laughs> in case we have more questions. Yes. If any questions arise, you, you can certainly ask those as well. Um, we're, but at this time, we are going to transition to our next presentation of the evening, which, uh, which is instruction and technology, which will consist of general education and special education. We'll begin with Ms. Sanfilippo to introduce the presentation, and then we'll transition over to Ms. Samerling and uh, the other department heads as well. Curriculum and Instruction, Pupil Personnel Services and Special Education, and Instructional Technology and Data. So our first part of the presentation is on Curriculum Instruction, and that will be presented by Deirdre Ammerling, the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the time tonight to present the instruction portion of the budget for school year 24-25, which includes pupil personnel services and technology. As always, we begin with Yorktown's vision statement, which you have seen many times over the past seven years, as it represents all of our work for Yorktown students. This vision sets a path of clear expectations in planning for our students, curriculum, and programs. Along with implementing comprehensive academic programs, we strive to build empathy, creativity, and critical thinking, and work to provide multiple opportunities for students to explore varied areas of interest. I know our school community has seen the next slide many, many times but it is important as it represents the overarching goal in Yorktown, that of educating the whole child. We know that all components of our K through 12 program are important and valued as they contribute to the overall experiences of our students. Therefore, we continually look at providing enriching opportunities in all areas. We've just heard about some exciting happenings in athletics and co-curricular and we will also address some of the other areas indicated here, academics, social emotional learning, the arts, et cetera. We begin with an overview of the organizational chart for instruction as it reflects a team of over 550 dedicated faculty and staff that work collaboratively to support our students. While that is a large number, 
We truly work as a united team for our students and community. Our supervisors, Ms. Chesser for Humanities and Mr. Miller for STEM, have been critical in collaborating with staff in all buildings and moving our K-12 curriculum and instructional priorities forward. I just want to give them a very special thank you for their hard work and dedication. They are here tonight in the audience. This staffing list really encompasses our entire instructional team. It is our supervisors, directors, building administrators, all our teachers and assistants, counselors, nurses, library media specialists, clerical, etc. The list encompasses so many professionals. Each position here is so vital to supporting the needs of our students and truly educating the whole child. As part of the budget review process, we carefully evaluate the role of each individual to ensure that our students are being served most effectively. The goal of the curriculum department is to ensure that meaningful instructional programs are in place for all of our students. This work includes a carefully designed curriculum based on the New York State Learning Standards, the implementation of effective instructional strategies, and assessment practices to help guide teaching and learning. A wide variety of programs and services are in place to serve the needs of our students and support the whole child philosophy. We continue to partner with BOCES and Lyric as they provide valuable support to our work and in strengthening our programs. We have truly utilized their services, all that is listed here, and expertise throughout the year. This slide represents an overview of the services that are being utilized this year and are included in the budget for continuation next year. I wanted to take this time to provide some highlights of some of our work throughout the school year. We began our year day one with a focus on artificial intelligence. While this had some mixed emotions at the beginning, it has become a highly focused and exciting area, particularly at the secondary level, where the teachers have embraced how AI can be an incredible asset to teaching and learning. Teams of teachers have participated in both BOCES workshops and Lyrics Model Schools program to learn how best to leverage AI in the classrooms. The Model Schools work has been exciting as teachers have led the development of a project in their content area. This work is actually finishing up this month, and we look forward to presentations in April where teachers will celebrate and share with others highlights of their work and its impact on their program. We are looking to identify an AI platform that meets our data privacy needs and is user-friendly to both teachers and students. We are exploring platforms such as School AI and Magic School, and will include a larger group of teachers and administrators to make a final decision. We will then plan for rollout and professional development for our faculty. Earlier this year, you met Stephanie Conroy, who provided an overview of our new data platform, EduClimber, and how it assists us in evaluating, stu evaluating student progress. EduClimber has been integral in moving our MTSS work forward, and I do want to thank Stephanie, as she is invaluable to this work. We have developed data teams in each building and provided training to classroom teachers, administrators, reading specialists, and interventionists to increase a shared understanding of the data that is collected in order to identify appropriate interventions that support individual and small group instruction. There was a lot of buzz in the media and educational community around the science of reading, particularly in the early grades this year. We have always had a robust program in Yorktown through our curriculum and reading intervention programs. This year, we have spent a great deal of time looking at this body of research with the supports of consultants from Living Literacy Network. Our work has included looking at small group instruction, particularly around decoding and phonics at our elementary levels. Throughout this work, we have identified instructional resources that would benefit our students and have incorporated Lexia, 
a research and evidence-based program for all kindergarten and first grade students. Lexia is a digital program that has benefits for at-risk to advanced learners in a structured approach to phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. Our K and first grade teachers have fully embraced it and we look forward to expanding its use for all second grade students next year. Teachers know how to read student data, assign individual skills, provide direct instruction, and monitor student progress using this program. This year, we have also provided professional development to our kindergarten and first grade teachers and teaching assistants in the Hegarty Phonemic Awareness Curriculum. Hegarty focuses more on developing decoding and encoding skills, and it is a complement to our foundations program as foundations focuses more on phonics, spelling, and handwriting. We have included our UPK teachers in this professional development and have provided them with the materials needed. We are really excited to see the gains of this work and its impact on our next year's kindergarten students. IXL is a digital resource that we have had for both math and ELA at all grade levels up through high school. This year, teachers have participated in updated professional development where they have focused on using IXL as a diagnostic assessment where they can assign key skills to individual students. STAR has been our universal screener for the past nine years, and it provides a comprehensive view of student progress, achievement, and growth. We're looking forward to upcoming professional development next month to take a deeper dive into each component of the assessments. With this information, teachers can continue to address individual student skills and needs. We are in our second year of full implementation of TC writing, kindergarten through grade five. It has been exciting to attend the many celebrations of published student work and our teachers remark on a dramatic increase of students' understanding of the writing process and their excitement around writing. Ms. Chesser, our supervisor of humanities, works closely with each grade level to unpack each unit, enhance them through identifying mentor texts that reflect greater diversity in characters and authors, and reflect on assessment and practice. Innovation grants were an exciting addition this year as they have encouraged our teachers to reflect on their program and look to increase student engagement, opportunities for learning, and provide unique experiences for our students. It was nice to see Mr. Videos and the students' presentation a little well earlier, and it reflects how the I grants have created wonderful and enriching learning opportunities for the students. We are excited about the new courses offered at the high school this year in the areas of drones, sports medicine, and film as literature. The teachers presented earlier this school year as they were planning for the courses and are excited that they are now up and running and that students are benefiting from them. Computer science and digital fluency standards have continued to be a focus of work under the supervision of Mr. Miller, our supervisor of STEM, a guidance document for each grade level band has been created that identifies each standard and where it falls within our curriculum. Mr. Miller will provide additional review with the teachers in the coming months, and we are ready for the CSDF standards to be fully implemented in September. As we continue to plan for the 24-25 school year, there are key priority areas that we are excited about. We will continue to ensure the vertical and horizontal alignment of curriculum in all content areas. We look forward to continuing high quality professional development in key areas such as the science of reading, e-steam, AI, and individualized instruction. We remain committed to the development and implementation of an MTSS plan that reflects both academic and behavioral supports. As mentioned earlier, our work in AI will continue to be a major focus, as will be the encouragement of the I-grants to enhance our programs. We look forward to exploring new courses, especially at the secondary level, 
primarily in the areas of world language and esteem. We have begun a review of our language offerings and have observed a decline in students, particularly in the area of French. We continually look to see what our students are interested in, and there has been expressed interest by the high school in offering American Sign Language. This is also of interest at the middle school level. I do look forward to providing you with additional data in, the near in a future meeting that require, um, reflects this. We are looking forward to building new and meaningful courses at the middle school in East Team and partnering with Project Lead the Way as a resource for developing these courses in areas that include robotics, coding, flight, and space to provide our students with invigorating and high interest courses as they prepare for high school. So that concludes my portion of the presentation and I would like to invite up Ms. Caroline Almeida, our Director of Pupil Personnel Services. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Hatter, Mrs. Carbone, Mr. Mignani, and trustees. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk about the Pupil Personnel Services Department and some budget considerations. The first uh, slide shows our organizational chart, and we can see that there's a lot of different departments that fall under PPS. We have our school nurses and our special education teachers and occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, and many other providers, our social workers included. We have some staffing numbers here for you in terms of special education teachers. Currently, as of this year, 68.2. Psychologists, nine, one of which is funded through a grant. Social workers, we have nine. Speech and language pathologists, 12 occupational therapists and certified occupational therapy assistants. Six, we have nine nurses district-wide, including one nurse who's a one-to-one -one nurse. We, had one, we have 118 certified teaching assistants, two full-time reading teachers in our department, and two full-time behavioral specialists. The next slide talks about the different numbers, and uh, the most important thing I think to note on this chart is the trend that we see in terms of the, the overall numbers increasing in special education, as well as in uh, what we refer to as 504. 504 serves students with disabilities, but not through special education. Many of the students on 504 plans receive related services and or accommodations in the classroom. And what we can see here is that the numbers overall are growing each year. Um, I left up on here the numbers from previous years because I wanted to show that trend. And um, a lot of people have asked if since COVID the numbers have been increasing, and they certainly have been, although not strictly due to that, I don't believe. We also have a number of students who move into the Yorktown School District from other school districts already with a 504 plan or an IEP in place. And so the bottom row on this chart shows the numbers of students who have transferred in. We have had 23 students transfer in this year. And the row just about above that shows the pending referrals. And we have a lot of students who are referred for evaluation. Some of those students go on to be classified and some don't. And so the number of current pending referrals is 69. And we do expect our overall number of classified students to grow by the end of the school year. Um, and part of this increase is due to the, the number of students requiring services, but also what the numbers don't show is the complexity of the need that we see. And so I, it, while it wouldn't show up in a chart like this, um, we are also seeing a trend toward higher need with students. In previous presentations, we've talked a lot about the increase particularly in the social emotional needs of students. And that's a trend that we continue to see rise. When we look to um, projections for next year, we always look to the trends, but we also look to um, the meetings that we have. It's, it's our Section 504 meetings and our CSE and CPSC meetings that determine what services students receive. 
And so it's impossible to predict exactly what the needs will be because those are determined at the committee. But in general, we have a good sense of it and uh, try to, to give the best estimate as possible. One thing that has remained constant in all of the years is the support of our Board of Education in our community. And um, that's that's been wonderful. And I think that a lot of people who do move here for our services cite that as a reason. So we're, we're proud to have a good reputation and we're proud of the work that we do to serve our students in our community. And it's not, it wouldn't be possible without all of us working together. Um, this next slide talks about the continuum of services that we provide to students with disabilities. The New York State Education Department has what's known as the regulations of the commissioner. And those regulations determine what is referred to as a continuum of services. And we're proud to offer a full continuum of services here in Yorktown. We do have some students who uh, receive services through general education through the PPS department. We typically refer to those programs and services as building level supports uh, or building level interventions, including things like speech improvement services. We have related services, which are speech language therapy, counseling, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, as well as some parent counseling and training, some vision services, hearing services, whatever related services students need. Many of our students, the majority of them, are served in a wonderful program called the Integrated Co-Teach Program. That's the newest program that was added to the Continuum of Services. And in the Integrated Co-Teach Program, we have a general education classroom with a general education teacher and a special education teacher working alongside each other to deliver instruction to all of the students in the class, including the specialized instruction that the students in that classroom who are special education require. And it's important to mention that there are a certain uh, maximum number of students allowed in each of the programs and that ratio is set by the New York State Education Department. So for instance, in an integrated co-teaching class, the maximum number of students with special education is 12. And we always look to have no more special ed students than general ed students within a, within a classroom if possible. We have various special class programs here. Our most restrictive special class program in this district is the 812 program. It's a wonderful program that serves the needs of more severely disabled students, primarily on the autism spectrum. Um, we also have a 1212 program and a 151 program. Um, and as, as students get older, we see those ratios grow a little bit um, accordingly. We have resource room programs. We do have some students whose needs cannot be met within our own public school buildings for varying reasons. Sometimes it's we have one student in a cohort with a very particular profile and we need a specialized program for that individual. And, um, and other times we, we don't have the, um, the specialization needed to meet the needs of the students. And so for that reason, we may turn to another public school district or a BOCES program or a New York State approved private school to provide services for our, our students. Um, and then sometimes we do have students who require a residential school if their needs are high enough. And sometimes home instruction or hospital instruction is required, um, preferably on short-term basis for both of those. We, we strive to meet the needs of our students within our school buildings whenever we can. And it's always a difficult decision when we need to look for a program outside of a school district for a student. And each year we meet for annual reviews for our students. And one of the things that we're looking to do is bring students back when and if we can. So if we have a program that can now meet the needs of the student or if the, if the student's needs have changed and we can now meet their needs in district, we'll revisit that each year at their annual review. For our students who are served out of district, we utilize the services of Putnam North and Westchester BOCES most frequently. We have several students at Southern Westchester BOCES in various programs. Rockland BOCES serves two of our students currently. We have some students at other public school districts and some approved private day schools in, in the region. 
We do service some students who are parentally placed at private schools, most notably within our district boundary. We have the St. Patrick's Parochial School, and we serve 17 students there currently. We have two students at a yeshiva that we service as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we have some approved residential schools that we have students at. And our department arranges services as well as the meetings and the evaluations for all of the students every year, including the students who are placed at out-of-district programs. One of the needs that I mentioned has been increasing in recent years is the social-emotional needs of students. And we do have a higher number of students who are requiring therapeutic supports. And although we have counseling and wonderful social workers and psychologists within our buildings, sometimes students need an, an, an environment that itself can be more therapeutic in nature. And that's the biggest rise that we've seen in recent years is the number of students presenting with significant social emotional needs that require that level of therapeutic environment or setting. And so um, when we look to the students who are struggling within our schools right now, that's the biggest population. And so for that reason, we have an additional 16 students that we project will need an out-of-district placement over the next 12 months. Um, and average to I should mention that average tuition and transportation is approximately $80,000 per student. So if we were to send an additional 16 students out of district, it would come at a cost of just under 1.3 million. And um, the numbers, uh, the rates, I should say, are, are not set by us. They're set and determined by New York State Education Department depending upon the school and the program and their staffing. Um, so it's not a negotiable number as we place students. Um, and so for this reason, I've been working with our central administration and our building uh, principal, Mr. DiGennaro at the high school and our wonderful team of clinicians at our high school to help identify some students who fall into this category and to think about what we can do innovatively to create a program here in district to meet the needs of these students. And what that would essentially take is building a new program that we don't currently have that would be a therapeutic program for students. And so I'm excited to present that to you. One of our um, high school teachers termed the, terms it the FlexPath program. And as soon as we heard that name, we loved it. And um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about our proposal for the FlexPath program. And before I do so, I just want to back up a step and say that the students who would be appropriate for this program are students who have challenges that impact their academic progress as well as their social emotional well-being. And these challenges could stem from a variety of factors. Trauma, anxiety, depression, learning disabilities, and difficulties with social interaction. And what sets a therapeutic program apart from more traditional programs is its integrated and more flexible approach. And in this particular case, for the program that we're proposing, we would be looking to blend academic online instruction with tailored, individualized, social-emotional therapeutic supports for every student in the program. It is our hope that we can open this program in, in September of 2024. And in doing so, we would, we believe that we can keep many of those 16 students in district. I should point out that of the 16 students that we project will need therapeutic settings, not all are high school students. This FlexPath program is proposed at the high school level for next year. Um, there are other students in need of therapeutic programs who are younger. When we look to create a program, we're looking for a certain number of students that makes the program viable. Um, and we're also looking for other factors that we can um, count on to support the students. We don't want to run a program if we can't adequately support the needs of our students within that program. And so programs are carefully planned. And um, this particular program, FlexPath, would utilize some of our existing staff as well as some new staff. 
and it would require repurposing a space. Currently, the space that houses the Pupil Personnel Services Department at the top of the main campus, uh, the modular buildings known as the Support Services Building, would be an ideal spot, we think, for this program. So there would be some, some costs for um, some minor renovation to that space and for some furniture needs and some other needs to get the program up and running. And in terms of staffing for the program, we are estimating our total costs to, to run this program at 650000 for the year. Um, and that's in the first year. And it would be more in the first year because of the cost of the renovation of the space and the furniture needs to set up the program. We would look to have a psychologist or a social worker with the program full time to provide the DBT support and other therapeutic supports and counseling. Two special education teachers with the program. Uh, one. 0.4 of which would be a new position, 0.6 would be an existing staff member from the high school, physical education at a 0.1, um, a teaching a teaching cert, uh, assistant, excuse me, who's already in the program, so that would be a reassignment, and the cost of the online programs. And we'd be looking at different platforms for online learning to make sure that the needs of all of the students can be met, because we understand that not every student learns best on a specific online learning platform. And something else that's important to note as we consider this program for next year is that we added a new program a year or two ago called the Bright Program. And that Bright Program was designed as a transition back to school program. So it's a therapeutic short-term support for students who perhaps are hospitalized and then returning to school and need a transitional therapeutic support program in between. And um, that program, the Bright program, would essentially merge with this FlexPath program. And so we would still offer the Bright program. We would still have that support, that critical support there for students as they transition from a mental health crisis back into our school. Um, and while also serving We'd imagine up to 14 other students at a time. The YES program is a program at the high school that's been very successful as well and works with students who struggle with executive functioning skills, things like organization and planning. And so we would incorporate the YES program and the FlexPath program as well so that the students who are currently taking advantages of, advantage of the support of YES and BRIGHT would still be served in this program. Uh, while also it would be a, a placement on an IEP for special ed students who needed a therapeutic setting and additionally could support the needs of general ed students who were also in need of a, such a program. One of the other resulting effects is that if we build the program in the support services building, that would displace the pupil personnel services department. And so we would look to repurpose th some of the space over at the French Hill School for, for the purpose of housing the PPS department. So there are some um, considerations in the budget for next year for the, the repurposing and the minor remodeling of both spaces. So as we look at the budget for 24-25, we're focused on the creation of this innovative FlexPath program for our students while also ensuring that the needs of our larger population of students with disabilities is met through programs that we already have, including expansion of some current programs. One of the programs that we do want to expand is the science program at the high school for students with disabilities. We do see a need for more options in special ed there, as well as uh, an additional special class math program, or a period of math special class in the middle school. We are mindful of our continuum of services. We feel a great commitment to meeting the needs of all of our students. We're also mindful that tuitions for out-of-district placements not only are growing in number, but the cost for those programs goes up by about 3% every year. So that's another factor to consider. Um, the need for evaluation for students has gone up considerably in recent years. There's uh, an assessment that we often do for students who are at risk called the risk assessment, and it looks at how, uh, how much risk students are at 
in terms of their social emotional needs and and our social workers and psychologists spend a lot of time with students and families assessing those needs we've done threat assessments this year psychological evaluations psychiatric evaluations functional behavioral assessments um, a functional behavioral assessment is a tool that's used to look at some concerning behavior that a student is demonstrating and to get to the root of what is causing that behavior and then to develop both proactive and reactive strategies to reduce and eliminate those behaviors. We also have an increase in the number of meetings and the complexity of meetings and the com overall complexity of the work that we do in the PPS department. And as we look ahead to next year, we do have some priorities that we focus on. The majority of these things are, are focuses that we continually look at each year, which I think is important for our department as it evolves to meet the changing needs of our community. We continue to monitor the CSE process and work collaboratively with the other departments and buildings for pre-referral intervention data and strategies, evaluation of students, timeliness of evaluations, timelines of those evaluations and the process um, of monitoring students' progress after they're classified as well. We continue multi-year planning as we evolve to meet the needs of our changing students. We evaluate new programs such as the Bright program and look to see how we can make those programs even more beneficial as we move forward. Um, in this case, merging it with FlexPath, we think is a great idea that would magnify the effect of both programs for students, and it makes sense to house them together. We look to provide initial and recertification training in nonviolent crisis intervention to our staff, and do doing updated training and threat assessment for our teams, as well as risk assessment training. And we look at space. You know, we work with the central office administrators and the building principals to prioritize the space for our students. And, and the one thing I will mention here is that it, it's not always the case that every student is educated in their own home school building. We have two elementary schools that serve K-3 children, Brookside and Mohansic, and they're both wonderful schools. But we can't have every program always every year in both buildings. Um, either because of space reasons or because of the numbers of students who need a program. If we have three students at Mohansic in first grade and four students at Brookside in first grade, it doesn't always make sense to run two programs, one in each building. There are years where we may run a grade level of a program or an entire program in one building and not the other. And so there are instances where a student may have to leave his or her home school and attend school in another building. And I think it, that'll be the case for next year as well. And we take those decisions very seriously um, and constantly look to see what we can do better, how we can improve, and how we can shift our thinking and what we do to better meet the needs of all of our students. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. And Ms. Forsberg is going to come up next to speak about technology and data. What did you do? Do you want to sit down to present? No, so I can lean Are you on, sure? I can lean on my other side. Well, why don't you just, <laughs> you can sit down at the table if it's easier. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so I look forward to talking about the technology and data programs here in the district. With a relatively small technology and data staff, we're able to manage a state-of-the-art technology infrastructure that provides access to an ever-growing number of digital tools for over 4,000 users, as well as our families. This year, we are staffed with one technician per school building, which has helped with faster service to our faculty, staff, and families. The additional support also helps with our phone needs, security camera system, print management system, and day-to-day -day operations, including cybersecurity monitoring and instructional programs. 
I do want to take a moment to thank our five technicians, two data analysts, two instructional technology coaches, and our IT department assistant. We truly function as a problem-solving team all day long. There is very little that happens in our district that does not involve either the network and or access to the internet during the school day, after school, and into the weekends. Much of the environment has not changed this year. However, there are continual upgrades and updates that are necessary to keep the district up to date. Updates this year include safety and security enhancements, additional security cameras, wireless casting technology, and more shared spaces and classrooms. This is year three of our MacBook Air pilot for teachers using one for their device, excuse me, using for their device, and we have around 200 teachers and administrators who are using the MacBook. We have been able to continue this dual platform scenario and we'll go into year four next year. The list of software on this slide and the next two slides are just a sample of the many software tools that our department supports and manages to keep the district safely connected. Many different types of technology outside of the instructional software tools are supported by our team. It is fair to say we support every single department with their software and any necessary integrations with our data team and single sign-on. Here is a small sample uh, of some of the over 200 apps, Chrome extensions, and software that are supported by the district. All software extensions and apps are vetted through an approval and review process which has been in place for five years. The review process ensures smooth communication, budget planning, and approving vendors against Educational Law 2D data privacy regulations. A full list is available on the website on the data page as well as the technology page. I apologize for the small print. Uh, this will be on the website if you would like to review further the review of cybersecurity upgrades. Cyber attacks continue and have increased specifically in the K-12 space. Unfortunately, the K-12 environment is not able to escape phishing and malware attacks. With the increase in a variety of cyber attacks in our area and nationally, we continue to upgrade and maintain our security fabric to include a host of tools with upgraded analytics, monitoring, and protection. Additionally, the district has contracted with consultants, user groups, and other vendors to conduct a series of testing and vulnerability scans, as well as consulting with experts for cyber strategy planning. I personally receive one to three emails a day of different sites to block, domains to block, and other necessary security updates, which has increased dramatically in the past couple years. Highlights from this year include little to no network downtime. I wanted to say no network downtime. I really couldn't think of a time that we were down, but it feels like we might have been for a little bit, but I really couldn't think of any time. Um, we've had little to no network downtime unless it was planned for projects, and they usually take place after hours or during the school breaks. Our help desk, which is data technology together, we have worked through over 8,000 tickets since July 1st. These tickets are opened by staff, students, or families to ask for all kinds of support. Everyone in our department has access to the ticketing system, and oftentimes one of these tickets will use multiple people to collaborate and solve. While some take 30 seconds, others may take a few days due in part to more research or a part that needs to be ordered. Some examples include preventative maintenance tickets to check for backups and down access points, teacher one-to-one -one support in the classroom, e-school data support, software support, and managing our Chromebook one-to-one -one program. One of our instructional technology coaches launched the new K through, kindergarten through third grade e-STEAM play dates very recently. These are te were teacher-centered, hands-on learning experiences facilitated by her in the two buildings. These sessions promoted collaboration, experiential learning, and professional growth in the educational technology space to support the eSteam program for our youngest learners. We are continually looking at our 911 system to make sure it's always working. We do periodic testing, and we were able to do some updates this year, which 
will have better location knowledge to the 911 call center and will allow them to call back into the classroom directly or an office, wherever the call comes from. We field tested the CBT in a simulation with success. This was in collaboration with Ms. Ammerling's department, our data team, and the buildings. Students had the devices they needed and the infrastructure was able to support. We are currently in the process of a few different data integration projects, which include what's called OneSync, so it's how student accounts are created and maintained, as well as an updated online system for food services. These types of collaboration projects involve eight to 10 people and are done over a series of six to 12 weeks with many deadlines along the way. And last year, we did a soft launch of a Vivi, which is a screencasting device built for education. Think of having less wires and easier ways for people to cast right to the screen from any device. We had a soft launch last year, and this year we have it in place in 60 different classrooms and offices. And priorities for next year. <clears throat> to continue the Chromebook one-to-one -one program, K-12. to Our team continues to support the entire district with these technical and data needs. As we look forward to next year, we plan to maintain this plant, the Chromebooks that was established after 2020, and next year will include phasing in the touchscreen Chromebooks. In addition, specialized classroom spaces that are in their device replacement cycle will have newer technology to support the curriculum that requires installed software. This is part of the regular and planned replacement cycle. The replacement cycle of devices is typically every four to five years, but it's dependent on the technology changes and the needs. In order to further the physical security and safety in our buildings, our PA system in each building is aging and needs to be upgraded. There's also many hardware and software integrations on the horizon for building safety and security. Last year, during this time, I presented a five-year network and infrastructure refresh plan that includes updates, maintenance, and upgrades. This is year one, so next year is year two of that planned program, which includes replacements and upgrades to switches, camera servers, other servers, and updating our firewall. As I shared earlier, cybersecurity and data privacy continue to be a priority, and in order to ensure we're doing the best that we can, I'm involved with a cohort of other tech directors, as well as a cybersecurity cohort, which includes one-to-one -one support and group meetings, so we, I always know what's going on in the region, but I also have support just for our district. Um, user groups, in-person and remote, we do different fishing expeditions and ongoing training. We launched Droplet this year to move many of our paper forms into the digital space that includes proper routing and approval process, and we plan to roll that out more next year. And last but not least, as Ms. Amberling touched on before, we're continually researching and looking into leveraging AI to enhance district operations in all areas, that, including security and curriculum and instruction. Thank you. Okay, so now um, I will review the budget summary for this, uh, for the instructional program. So there are a lot of numbers on this, um, on this slide, so we will go through all of them, I promise you. Um, so I just want to take a moment and remind everyone once more that these numbers are not final and that they're still subject to change. There's still one important piece of the budget that is outstanding and that is state aid. The state's budget is due April 1st, but it seems more and more likely that it will be late, perhaps by several weeks. The final state budget will impact the district's final budget, which will not be accepted by the board until April 15th. Hopefully we'll have the budget numbers from the state before then, um, but it looks like it's gonna be tight. Also, all department categories on the slide include salaries, equipment, contractual services, BOCES services, and supplies and materials for each category. 
Overall, the instructional program is increasing by 2.4%. You'd see that on the bottom line. So included in the curriculum and development department is the Office of the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, which contains all professional development expenses district-wide and the cost of any new initiatives. The supervision line includes the principal's offices at all five buildings. It also includes our security expenses, including our SROs at each school building. That expense is increasing by $50,000 for next year. The cost of the new AP, the proposed AP for the FlexPath program is also represented in this line. If you look at the teaching regular school line and the program of student with disabilities line, you can see that um, it, it looks like some money has shifted from one line to the other, and that would actually be um, due to some reclassifications that we made this year um, of some teachers, CTAs, and TAs from the general education budget codes to special education budget codes. These reclassifications are important because it increases the accuracy of the financial data that is reported to the state each year and can impact how our state aid is calculated. So it's not necessarily that anything was added or taken away from one line or the other. It's just we discovered a teacher was coded to general education, should have been coded to special education, so we corrected that. Of the 11 teacher retirements that the district has for next year, 10 of them are from the area of general education, and several of them are currently not budgeted to be replaced due to enrollment changes. Only one teacher retirement is from the area of special education. Also in the general education line is a contingency for an additional kindergarten teacher at Brookside. Additional FTEs are also proposed in the areas of science and music at the middle school. The equipment codes overall have been reduced by about $50,000, and the contractual service codes have been reduced by about $60,000, mostly uh, because of middle states, which is a process we're going through this year. We don't need to budget for that for next year. In our programs for students with disabilities line, one teaching position that was previously funded by the co one of our COVID grants is now included in the general fund. So these were positions that were hired using the federal money from COVID uh, to add to our programs, and that funding is no longer um, happening for us next year. This September is the end of it. So that position has to be incorporated into the, into the regular budget. Also included in this line are the cost of the proposed FlexPath program, a contingent special ed teacher at Mohansic, and a special ed science teacher at the high school, which is replacing five existing overages, as um, Caroline Almeida previously discussed in her slides. This line also includes all of our special education CTAs that are IEP mandated and out of district tuition costs. The next line is occupational education, and in, uh, this is the cost of tuition for our high school students to attend the career and technical education programs at Port Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES. The increase is due to increased enrollment in these programs. We have more students going out. Library and AV includes the cost of library automation systems and all databases district-wide. Educational television includes the cost of recording Board of Education meetings and other performances. Computer-assisted instruction includes all of our software and hardware purchases, technology infrastructure, technical support contractors through Edutech, and other BOCE services. Increases include Glowforge for $28,000, um, the upgraded PA systems in four of our buildings for $35,000, and some BOCE services, approximately $130,000. Guidance includes all guidance counselors at the high school and middle school, including a student intervention counselor at the high school. Health services includes the cost of all nurses district-wide and at St. Patrick's and the district physician. It also includes the cost of health and welfare services charged by other school districts uh, for that private, I'm sorry, that for private schools that our students attend in those districts. Psychological services includes all psychologists district-wide, inclu including um, a proposed psychologist for the FlexPath program. 
Social work services includes all social workers district wide, and the people per personnel services line includes the office of the director of PPS, including all related um, administrators and clerical staff. So overall, the summary um, shows that the program is increasing by 2.4%, a $1.6 million increase from last year's budget to this year's budget. And the final slide, oh, I'm sorry, I'm working two things here. Um, so our, again, our next budget presentation is next week with Dr. Hatter's final superintendent budget presentation, um, and the board will adopt on April 15th. Thank you. That was a lot of information to absorb. Of information. <laughs> um, so do you want to bring anybody up? Well, do we have everybody? Who do we need up we here? Oh, Caroline. Caroline up. Um, thank you very much, though. <laughs> um, Lisa, do you want me to start again with you? Sure. Um, so the instructional budget is increasing by 2.4% but the athletic budget is increasing by more than three times that, 7.6. And that concerns me somewhat, because I think that we should be directing our funds towards instructional, because that's what we're in the business of, educating children, not creating athletes. So I, I am a little concerned about that disproportionality. Can you address that a little bit, why one is increasing three times more than the other? Yeah, I, I'll start, and then Lisa can continue. <clears throat> Part of the increase, for this year, we budgeted for half of a strength and conditioning coach with the understanding, we, last year around this time, we were adding the position, we agreed it would start mid-year, and we agreed it would start mid-year because we wanted to allocate some monies to be able to hire school resource officers for our elementary schools. So the first, I would say, 50% of that increase to the athletic budget is solely to fulfill the remainder of that strength and conditioning coach so that that's no additional programming or any additional um, expenditures outside of the position that we had discussed prior year. The additional items from there are with regard to modified sports. If we decide to move forward with the modified sport offerings and some of the equipment requisitions that um, are <clears throat> made in Rob's budget, whether it's hurdles or mats for the uh, track and field team, uh, football equipment, field hockey equipment, and then finally there are contractual increases for the coaches that account for the remainder of the budget increase. At least if I left anything out, please. Uh, yeah. Well, I should just point out that does include the cost of bona fide, right? So that yes, is, yeah, yeah, you said that. that part of it. Yeah, but it's certainly something that I'll look at as I take into account all of the requests that were made because there were a lot of requests, whether it's from technology or PPS or uh, the um, instructional budget or athletics and each of the school buildings. So I'll certainly take, take that balance under consideration when I present to you my final presentation next week. Thank you. Cheryl? Uh, this question is for Ms. Almeida. You had indicated that there is an increase um, in SEL needs at this point. Um, and it looks like we're doing a lot to service on the back end. What are we doing on the front end? Um, and not only for uh, special ed, but for gen ed, so that I guess my question is potentially could we have a situation where if we did more and bulked up on the front end, would we eliminate? some of the back end needs um, in, in, in students in crisis. Yeah, and I think about that often and it's, it's one of the things that I spend a lot of time researching. Um, one of the things that we do is we look at the whole child and so we have our social emotional learning curriculum built in in every grade level in every classroom. We also have a lot of building level supports built in provided primarily by our social workers in the different buildings. And um, I think that prior to COVID, I was doing more in terms of working with the county um, through the county executive's office in terms of looking at things like technology use in young children. We still even now partner with different organizations like NAMI. We have the network. We actually lead a network um, in this region of community service providers and community agencies that are designed to help support people in the community. We partner with different hospitals. 
we have um, the Northern Westchester Hospital coming in to meet with us at our next uh, meeting to talk about a, a program that they're planning on opening. So we continually look to see what we can do to help support our community. Education is a big piece of that. I think in the future, one of the things that I would like to do is to devote more time and attention toward raising awareness in the community on things that parents, especially new parents, can do to help support children more. Um, wellness is really important. Diet, exercise. We're still seeing a lot of students um, struggling at a younger age with different behaviors, helping parents to understand the reasons why students might be struggling, um, looking at trauma, looking at response to trauma, understanding that cycle, um, and really working with parents more collaboratively and all of our staff to help the staff at every grade level and every building understand what trauma may look like in a classroom um, and being able to identify a student who's struggling as a student in need um, and not necessarily as a student who is, is easily uh, redirected. The needs are more complex than that now. So a lot of it has to do with the training that we provide for our staff and um, and the community resources that we have and utilize within our network. Thank you. Rishmi? Um, I have a question for uh, Ms. Forsberg. Um, so in looking at the long list of items and priorities, um, I guess my question is, are these mainly just upgrades and maintenance and you know keep the lights on kind of things, or are any of these uh, what you would consider investments? The majority of the items listed are ongoing replacements, upgrades, and maintenance, uh, which I think is an investment to keep the technology going and the best infrastructure we can have, the students learning with whatever device, tools, or software that they need. There isn't anything on here in particular that's new other than um, building safety and security type upgrades and different hardware, software, technology integrations that come along with that as, as we move into the future, which I think is an, an investment. Um, okay, thanks. Mike? Uh, my question would be somewhat similar to uh, Reshmi's. Um, first, just a, an observation. The, the current program that um, you've put together for us uh, on a technology basis is truly staggering and the upgrades I think uh, have been uh, equally as important. I guess my question is uh, it, within this is there any additional need for staffing uh, on your in your department or are you strictly relying on what you have now and and doing more with you know technology? I in all honesty, I think it would be helpful to have an additional support to help with all the cybersecurity management. There's a lot that goes into it that, that I do personally, um, and then the technicians, of course, do some of that, but I think it would be helpful to have more support in that area specifically. Okay, thanks. Adelina? My question is to Ms. Almeida. So, um, Without the FLEX program, then that could increase the budget by 500000 if we're going to send our students out of district, right? Because this budget has the FLEX program. This within. budget doesn't, the proposal is in there for the FLEX PATH program, including the cost for the first year, which would be the startup cost, the, the renovations for the facilities um, and the furniture for it. So in the first year, the program would cost 650. In subsequent years, it would cost less than that, while the cost for the out-of-district tu tuitions is approximately 80,000 per student and growing at a rate of 3% per year. This program, and forgive me if I didn't mention it before, is designed to serve students in grades 9 through 12. So we anticipate that this will be a successful program. We're committed to it, and uh, if, if, it, if, if it passes. And um, we project that in the future it will serve the needs of more students who are right now perhaps in the, in the middle school. 
So long term, I think it's difficult to project how much it will save us on a budgetary standpoint. And um, perhaps even more important from that is the commitment that we have to our students and our family to meet their needs and to do so here in our district close to home, which also results in some other costs that maybe are hard to realize through the presentation, such as transportation. If we were to send all of these students to out of district programs, those programs are throughout the region, including in some cases in Rockland County. And so when we have our students here, we're not only servicing them close to home and in their community, and we think we can do it really well, uh, but we're also saving tuition costs and even transportation costs. Do you have any out of district students that you'd be bringing back for this program? I love that question. And as we meet with the clinical team at the high school to identify students that we are building this program for, we are remiss as we think about the students who have already gone out of district who would be a good fit for this program. And we are anticipating that there's at least one, if not two, students that may return as early as September to this program with an eye perhaps in the future on bringing some other students back. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, Caroline, I just want to thank you. Your presentation, you speak with such kindness and thoughtfulness towards all the students, and that's just so nice to hear, so thank you. Thank not that we, not that any other special ed <laughs> has ever spoken any other way, but you just have such a nice delivery, so thank you. Um, if we put in the FlexPath program, it means that PPS goes to French Hill, which is quite a distance away from the main campus and all the other central office. So how does that work? for you? It, it would be a shift for us, but me and my entire team of staff up at the PPS office have always put the needs of the students first. And while it may be a little bit more uh, challenging to get in the car on a rainy day and drive the five minutes down the road um, and to, to come here multiple times a day, it's, it would be a pleasure to do that if it meant that our students could have the program that they need here on their home campus. Thank you. Lisa? Um, Ms. Ammerling, are there, uh, how are the new courses for the high school chosen, and are there new courses in the works for the next school year? They really do come from the teachers um, and working with the students. They really don't come from me or my office. Um, it really is born from the teachers interacting with students, looking at interests um, in their own respective areas, knowing what's out there, what fields students should be getting ready for um, after high school. Um, in terms of looking at the development of the ESTEAM courses that we want to see for the middle school, that also was largely driven by teacher interest and there wasn't a lot of continuity, certainly horizontally or vertically. So in the, the development of that, that one was where um, I certainly did get a little bit more involved in just trying to think and plan for um, giving all of those students the same type of experiences so that when they go and they reach these high school courses that they're ready for those demands and that they're able to access um, and have the skills that they need to for readiness. Um, so largely, a lot of it is, is just kind of like organic, and it comes out of interest. Um, in terms of looking at the language, it was a conversation that I had with Erin um, Fink, um, guidance counselor over at the, the high school, who um, said that she had been for a couple of years thinking about how beneficial American Sign Language and how often that has come up. Um, and it just seems like a lot of things kind of came together at once. Um, I, if, I know she won't mind me sharing because she's so passionate about it, but Ms. Chesser um, lives in the deaf community um, as her sister is, is, is deaf, and sign language has been a big part of, of her family's life. Um, and she shares that openly because, again, you, through conversations with different teammates in the buildings, um, you have this growing interest around something. And uh, we, we partnered with some colleagues in, in Ossining and spoke to some people in White Plains and just saw how some of this has grown in, in their communities and the need for those things. So sometimes they happen um, just organically and in, through conversation. Oftentimes it's teachers presenting to us things that um, they've heard from our students that they're interested in. 
And then those teachers who express that interest, are they the ones who then pilot the course? Or do you bring someone in from the outside to do it? Like the sports medicine course, I, I mean, yeah, I didn't even know we had that. That's amazing. Yeah, that, that definitely was driven by um, teachers that were interested. So, you know, working with the building principals, looking at teachers' schedules to see would it allow for it. Um, oftentimes they find the way because they definitely want to deliver um, these high interest areas to the students. So they do look to accommodate as, as much as possible. I've not heard of a course offering over the last couple of years where it was a no, we can't do that because you don't have room in your schedule. I think they're very creative at times to look to find that flexibility in, in a program, even if they're running something just for maybe one semester to see uh, what the student is and the continued interest would be in that area. All right, thank you. Cho? Staying on the same topic, I, I had a question on the new courses at YHS this year. Do we have any data uh, surrounding the enrollment in those three classes? We do. Um, some of the classes are a little bit smaller, and uh, the drone class grew from a club and developed into, into a course. That one is, is small right now. I, it's four students, but I do believe that um, it, it will grow because it's just been so well received. It's exciting, it's, it's new, it's innovative. Um, the course Sports is Medicine that had a, a larger showing, it's, it was 12 students. Um, and then the film is literature had 28 students registered. Wow. So that was, that was really interesting to see that that yeah. one. Um, but I think as the courses grow, as students hear about them, sure. and they look to see what fits within their program. I think sometimes our students would love to take a lot of things, but it just doesn't actually fit, um, whether it's in the schedule or it's what are the, uh, the other courses that they're taking. Yeah, some of the subjects take a few years to take groups. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Okay, wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Where should we? Mike? Um, <clears throat> Ms. Almeida, the uh, FlexPath program is something that's um, just being rolled out tonight, obviously. Um, can you speak to two things? One is, is this something that is being done elsewhere? In, in other words, is it a sort of an established program that we're bringing in? And then I, I see that a lot of the teaching or learning that goes on in it is online courses. So can you just kind of speak to how that works? Yes, and thank you for those questions. I probably should have spoke a little bit more about those two pieces when I was talking. The program would be, the FlexPath program would be considered both an alternative program and a therapeutic program. And previously in this region, most of our alternative programs were not therapeutic programs. And likewise, most of our therapeutic programs were not alternative programs. And one of the drawbacks of um, and either of those types of programs, but especially a therapeutic program, is having the flexibility to be able to build a student's schedule around their needs while also serving students in a grade 9, 10, 11, 12, and having the staff to be able to teach the classes. And so if you were to have in-person instruction, a live teacher, you would need a tremendous amount of staffing because you might have one student in a Global 9 class and you might have two students in Global 10 while you have one student in economics and you have three students in English 9 and four students in English 10, but the students in English 10 can't all take English at the same time. And so the, the logistics of trying to staff the, the instructional part of that program makes it cost prohibitive to run the program. And the other thing that has failed with a lot of the um, alternative programs is the flexibility of it has to be a certain type of flexibility. And a lot of the alternative programs that I've been familiar with over the past 31 years have been flexible in perhaps what I would describe as the wrong ways. Um, whether, you know, allowing children to make unhealthy choices or allowing unhealthy choices to be acceptable and that type of flexibility. In this program, what would really set it apart is that the flexibility would be between two or three healthy choices. So it may be your schedule. 
perhaps in the morning, you really need to start off your day with counseling before you can get into your academics. And maybe you need the flexibility to do your English curriculum a little bit slower. And you might finish in 14 months instead of 10 months. Somebody else might move through math curriculum faster. Um, you may be the type of student who likes to do long blocks of learning, math for two hours straight, and then take a break and then do science for two hours straight, versus a student who might like 45 minutes of this class and then might like 45 minutes of that class. And this program, the way it would be built, would serve students who need an alternative approach. It would provide all of the therapeutic supports that students need, including DBT, which is a, a spe specific type of um, group counseling, distress tolerance building, coping mechanisms for students, which would be so critical um, in helping them on their path to wellness. And it would include a lot of other more flexible but healthy options. And I think the best way to describe it is if I talk to you about the Bright program that we have now in our high school that we're so proud of. We have a Bright program where students go oftentimes for maybe three or four days as they're transitioning back from Four Winds Hospital or another hospital. This is a flexible but very supportive and structured center where they can go. It's calming, it's relaxing. There's some therapeutic support in there and they can work on their classes, reacclimate to the school and then move into their other classes. And I can't tell you how many of the students who have utilized that support have said the same thing. If only I could stay in here all day, every day. Because for a lot of students, the larger school setting with the bigger classes and the more structured day isn't always right for them. If you're in the middle of a, a, a social issue or an emotional crisis, it's very hard to sit and go, well, you know what? It's third period and you have to go to English. It's very hard to go to English and sit there and concentrate when really what you need is in the moment counseling. So this program gives kids the flexibility to have the counseling that they need when they need it right there. And it gives them the flexibility to build their day when they need it. And an important part, although it is online instruction, we are looking into different platforms for that. Educeer, Fusion Academy, and other programs to make sure that the online instructional piece is right for every student who's in there. Because there are some students in there who struggle academically and have learning disabilities and do need more support with their academics. And that's where the support of the special education teachers in the program would come in handy and would be essential too for those students. They would provide consultant teacher direct support and resource room support as needed for the students in that program. So that anything that needs to be modified from the online platform for that student could be modified specifically for that student academically. And I think that there's a number of things that would make our program differently and that I think highlights some of them. Sorry, just a follow-up. Uh, I mean, it's to me, it's fascinating approach. Uh, I guess I'm still trying to understand: is is this something you created, or is this something that's being done elsewhere that we're going to try to, you know, copy or so to speak? It's not something that's being done elsewhere. Um, it is something that I worked with the team at the high school on, along with a vision that I've had for many years. Um, I don't know what other people do in their spare time. <laughs> I'm probably not going to make myself sound too good here, but I spend my spare time looking at research and looking at what I know has worked and what hasn't worked and trying to put the pieces together of the things that have worked. What we have right, ne right now in Yorktown is a, a clinical team that's beyond what most districts have. And we have a need that's beyond any need that we've ever seen before. So if we have the resources, we have the people, we have the techniques like DBT, and we can merge that all together, um, I think we can have a really successful program. And more than anything, I think what I've looked at is what hasn't worked, what hasn't worked in other alternative programs and what hasn't worked in some therapeutic settings. And so when we look at everything that we know that does work and everything that we know that doesn't work, and we make all of these things our priority. 
I, I, I don't see how we can't be successful, especially when we're committed to uh, a process of evolving and looking at what we're doing and auditing ourselves to make sure that we make the adjustments that we need to continue to meet the needs of our students. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity for this program. Go ahead. Um, this is probably more for the rest of the panel, but um, again, this is incredibly complex and, and fascinating approach. How are we gonna how are we gonna get this off the ground by September? I guess is is where I'm I'm looking at it and saying wow this is a lot to try to do and and accomplish in a relatively short period of time. So if we could speak just a little bit to how we plan on accomplishing that, that'd be great. I'll start and the team can, <laughs> can weigh in. I don't I don't think anybody on this dais here has any question and, and even our team in the audience we have uh, members of our central administration team in the audience as well i don't think anyone has any even question or concern on if we can do it I, I think we all believe we can do it and we'll be able to do it provided that we have your approval to move forward in 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 the budget process and it's something that i'll present next week but it's a matter of coordinating a bunch of different departments, all who are ready, willing, and able. It's getting facilities up and running and getting them ready to move the physical plant. It's getting the instructional technology ordered, which I know Jen's department can do and can do seamlessly. It's getting the staffing in place, which I know Caroline and her team will be working toward that. And, and there's a very motivated group of clinicians who stand at the ready to support the program. So it is a big lift, Mike, without question, it's a big lift. And it's not a program that we can look at other districts for a model. There are therapeutic programs, there are alternative programs. This is a, an innovative approach in bringing those two together. So we don't have a lot in the way of mentorship to go by, but I do think that we, we have a good vision and, and a good plan that's grounded in research that will require some a financial investment that I do believe will be offset by retaining children within our district and avoiding the out-of-district tuition payment, but but I wouldn't put it past this team to have this up and running for September. If anyone else wants to add on that, I, I, I believe that we'll be able to get this done without a problem. I think we'll have it done by July. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So thinking of the flex plan and talking about the course offerings in the high school, Will we be able to offer, and, and for general education students and special education students as a whole that are not on the AP track, um, will there be any course offerings either in the flex or in the high school for students, general education, special education to get college credit? Do we have that now and or will that be a part of that flex plan? Well, the instruction, the core instruction will be online. online. So I would think that an opportunity could exist if a student had the ability to do that and the desire to do that. I, I couldn't see why not. No. And I guess that's it. Do we have that in the high school? There were uh, college credit bearing courses that are offered at the high school. Um, in fact, they are looking at exploring uh, anatomy and physiology, which currently is a one semester course to become a year long so that students could earn a, a college credit from SUNY New Paltz. So they're constantly looking at, at ways to increase and have our students have that little uh, leg up when, when they go to college. Um, I have a question for Lisa. So I know you've been, last two years, you've been doing a lot of recoding, and I understand the recoding because it helps with the state aid runs, but at some point, will we be done with the recoding so we can do a comparative year to year because it's very difficult the way it is now? No, I, I agree. I, I, I understand that completely. And um, I just, yes, my hope is that we've gotten the majority of it by this point. I can't promise that there's not gonna be one or two things, but I think in terms of the big stuff, the big numbers, I feel like we've gotten a pretty good handle on that. So I, I'm hopeful that going forward will be consistent. Right. And just so the community understands, different codes have different state aid ratios. Is that correct? Well, I mean, it's part of that, but it's it's um, it's the calculation. It's, it's the different areas of your um, finances that they pull data from when they make these calculations. 
And it makes a difference if something's coded as a general ed expense versus special ed expense. So we just want to make sure that it's right. Um, so that um, for consistency as as well as making sure that we're getting um, all the all the aid that we're that we're entitled to. I appreciate that. Thank you. Lisa? Nothing else, thank you. Cheryl? I'm set, thanks. Freshman? Mike? And Lena? Yeah. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Go back to you, Ron. Okay. So next week, one week from tonight, I'll deliver my final presentation. We heard a lot of needs. We heard a lot of requests from the various departments, whether they're instructional in nature or whether they're part of an, an unfunded mandate whether it's in relation to the ERS and TRS increases, health insurance, insurance premiums, and all of the other factors, the transportation costs that we're going to experience as an increase for the coming school year <laughs> as a result of uh, the bidding process. So all of those factors will come together to one budget presentation next week, one week from tonight. I encourage members of our community to come out, hear the presentation. We, we want you to engage in this process. And we look forward to providing you with as much depth and detail as we can. The I, revenue part will be in that part of the budget? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, based on what we have, we don't have the state aid numbers at this point. So based on the information we have, we'll include the most accurate information. Thank you. I, I want to just give a special thank you to Acme Supermarkets. Quite often, I go into Acme right here in town in the Triangle Shopping Center to do some of my weekly shopping and you're asked, would you like to make a donation to support education? I generally say no, because I'm not <laughs> quite sure where the money is going. And it's difficult to track that. I make my own donations uh, as, as I see fit. But ACME sent us a series of gift cards to be used for families uh, who are in need, families who would certainly benefit from various uh, grocery items, and I want to thank ACME, and I want to thank our community, because these donations were made possible because people at the register said yes, they would like to donate a dollar or two dollars or round up their change. That's changed my perspective. So when I'm asked now, now that I've actually seen those monies come back to our school district to the tune of $2,850 to support families in our community, when I'm at that register now and I'm asked, would you like to make that donation, I will be saying yes because it's just so wonderful to be able to pay that forward now and help different families in our community who have different circumstances. And I, I just am so grateful to the people at Acme Supermarkets and their parent company for their very generous donation. But that all stems from you, our community, for making those donations at the register. So thank you to you. Thank you to Acme. We were delivered $2,850 worth of $25 gift cards to disperse throughout our communities. So right now I'm working with our school social workers to devise a plan for a distribution of those monies. Just a couple of other quick items. Frozen Junior, the middle school, if you attended Beauty and the Beast, it was great, absolutely great. I saw so many of our younger students coming out dressed in the bell costumes and, and just ready to go to a great show. Uh, I will tell you that Frozen Junior is being put on this weekend Friday night, March 22nd, 8, uh, 7 p.m. in our high school auditorium. Saturday night, 7 p.m., March 23rd in the high school auditorium. It's going to be great. Tickets are on sale. You can go to our website for uh, a link. Congratulations to our science research program. They participated in the WESF competition this weekend. 23 out of 30 students who participated are receiving awards. We don't know what awards they are yet. There's an award ceremony upcoming, but to have almost 80% of the students participating being recognized for their work is, is just tremendous. And finally, I had the opportunity to teach Husker Discovery classes today. Best part of my week, maybe the best part of my year is actually getting into the classroom. Today it was three full periods worth of instruction. Tomorrow I finished the other two classes. And we talk about interviewing and um, conversations with adults and advocating for oneself. And I was actually observed, so I, I know how our teachers now feel <laughs> with the observation process. We had our middle states evaluator come to 
our building today to the high school to uh, to conduct a pre-visitation for our middle states reaccreditation and one of the classes that was observed was my Husker Discovery class that I was teaching. So just a great day to spend with students and, and it, I appreciate the opportunity to stay connected in the classroom as um, as a teacher as well. So I thank you for that. That concludes my update. If you have the opportunity to come out to Frozen Junior, it is going to be great. I've seen some of the rehearsals. You're going to love it. Great. All right. We're going to move on to board reports. I'm going to start with Reshmi. Audit. All right. So we don't have any, any new updates for this meeting. I hope to have an update uh, for the next one. Okay. Uh, educational vi vision. No new updates. We will have a meeting on March 28th. Okay. Fiscal. Uh, no new updates. We have a meeting tomorrow morning. <laughs> Everybody's got a meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Policy. Uh, we met on March 7th. Um, all were present except um, uh, Lisa Sanfilippo wasn't able to be with us. We discussed four policies. Three of them are pending further review as we need additional information, which is actually coming in as we speak. Um, no recommendations to the board, follow-up items. Um, these are policies in continued review. At this point, wellness, code of conduct, and public use of facilities, and we'll be meeting next on April 11th. Okay, and I've got steering. I just want to point out, Chair, how come it's just you, your, your committee and my committee the ones have meetings? <laughs> <laughs> but steering has met twice. We met February 27th and March 12th. Um, we began discussions on the timing and the sequencing of the projects. The timing needs to be very carefully uh, lined up with our ability to borrow so that we keep this tax neutral as we promised. Um, design for the buildings is going to take about a year. Um, and so we're going to start. Um, and, and the beginning is going, they're beginning the process. And part of what Masi has to start to do is to get all of our building information into their systems. And once they have it all into their systems, then they actually walk the buildings to make sure everything is accurate. They can't design unless they know what they're starting with. Um, we decided we're going to start with Mohansic and Brookside first. So they will start designing those with the anticipation that those will go um, for a SED submission around January of 25. Um, we are also going to start working on the fields, the lower field and the upper, the new field and the baseball field. And um, the reason we're going to do that is even though we're going to get that to SED hopefully in September, it's going to take a lot longer to review. It's not just SED that has to review it. It has to have a DEC review. It may have to have federal review because we're in wetlands. So that review process is going to take longer because there are more entities involved. Um, so that, that anticipated start date for the baseball field would be probably be June of 25. Um, and we are anticipating the schools will probably start in June of 26. Um, Ron is going to start scheduling meetings with the elementary stakeholders so that they start to have input. And our next meeting, we have invited athletics to be able to discuss the field needs. Our next meeting is March 26th. And that was it. OK. Um, we're going to go up to board action items. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the March 4th meeting? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, motion to approve the treasurer's report for February 24th. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? A motion to approve the claims audit report for February of 24. So, second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? A motion to approve the extra classroom report as of February 24. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Personnel upon recommendation of the superintendent. A motion that the following be approved under certified personnel. We have appointments, some corrections, unpaid leave of absence. And under classified personnel, we have additions to the substitute list. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Business office, a motion to approve the legal notice for the budget vote and election on May 21st, 2024, as stated below. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, budget vote and election appointments. Resolved that the Yorktown Central School District appoints Jackie Carbone as a permanent chairperson for the 2024 annual school school budget vote and election at no compensation. Resolved that the Board of Education of the Yorktown Central School District appoint to serve the, as the chief election inspector of, for the 24 annual election and school budget vote and election to be compensated a flat rate of $325 for the day and an additional time at the rate of $21.67 an hour, and that's Fatima Ahmed. 
be it resolved that the Board of Education of Yorktown Central School District appoint the following individuals as election inspectors and or alternate election inspectors for the 24 annual school budget vote and election to be compensated at a flat rate of $300 for the day and an additional time rate of $20 an hour, and they are listed below. And resolved that the Board of Education of the Yorktown Central Sc School District appoint Jenny Menton Grasso and Judith Bloom to serve as Board of Registration Inspectors for the 24 annual school district election and vote budget vote to be compensated at a rate of $16 an hour. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolved that the Yorktown, the Yorktown Board of Education approve the agreement between the school district and the County of Westchester for the use of electronic voting machines, including the other equipment and services for the May 21st, 2024 annual meeting, and if necessary, the budget review vote to be held on June 18th, 2024. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye opposed? A motion to approve the following contract for well, contracts for health and welfare services provided to resident pupils attending non-public schools in other districts for the 23-24 school year. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Um, opposed? Uh, be resolved that upon recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education hereby declares the following O&M equipment items as surplus and recommends the sale and or disposal of said equipment via its auction management vendor, Absolute Auctions and Realty, Inc. They're listed below. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? A motion to approve the following budget transfers that are listed below. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? A motion to approve the following RFP awardee vendor agreements from school, source well purchase and cooperative for the 24, 2024 Yorktown High School Athletic Field Projects. It's A Turf and Field Turf USA, Inc. So moved. Second. Discussion. Lisa, can you just explain why we are now approving contracts for, that are on source well, which is a state contract? So um, we typically don't approve contracts for um, things that are jointly uh, cooperatively bid. In this instance, since the, due to the size of the project and um, just to ensure that we were covered for insurance purposes, we wanted to make sure that um, we had a signed, executed contract between us and the vendor, guaranteeing that they are providing the appropriate amount of insurance for these projects. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Special Education, a motion to approve the amendment to the independent contract for the 23-24 school year, the amendment number five for Stacy Mason. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Placements, a motion to approve the following placements as of March 18th, 2024. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Gifts, grants, and donations, a motion to accept with gratitude the following gifts, grants, and donations at Brookside, $1,260 for the third grade excursion to the Bronx Zoo from the Brookside PTA, and at Crom Pond, $2,000 for the fourth grade excursion to the Museum Vill Village from the Crom Pond PTA. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Board comments. Catalina. <laughs> A lot of information tonight. <laughs> A lot of information. And I feel like the last one we heard well, was from Miss Almeida, and just thank you for the vision. I know Mike had asked, you know, is there another school district that's doing this? But you're, you know, spearheading this in our district because it's what's best for our students. And you know, even though yes, it will save money, you spoke about how it would save children coming back and being connected to the district. So that really resonated. So thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of things tonight. Um, first, our you know we mentioned it before, but our our middle school student presentation was just off the charts impressive. Um, if that's what we're getting with these I grants, um, we, we got to keep moving forward with that. That was fabulous. Um, I wanted to also thank the presenters tonight. I know, I mean, the presentations themselves were incredible, but I know the hours and hours of work that goes into putting the budget together and and coming up with the presentations and being here and available to answer questions, and I, I truly appreciate that. And as Catalina mentioned, um, Ms. Almeida, the program that you've laid out um, is tremendous, and I hope we can come to some type of agreement on how we can implement um, something like that for our students because it would truly be beneficial to them and, and the whole district. So thank you for that. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out. Uh, I had the absolute pleasure of attending 
the um, Beauty and the Beast presentation on Friday night, and it I, I was blown away. I mean, our students, I know they're impressive, and I see a lot of what goes on, but um, I was struck by how how many different roles some of the, the students played, and they were, I mean, flawless. Some of them had two and three parts in the presentation, and they did just a tremendous job. The music, Musical. Sorry. Um, yeah, what I say? Too many presentations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was great. So anyway, thank you um, for that, and uh, I'll turn it over to Reshmi. Great night uh, tonight, and uh, thank you to our um, uh, administrators for being here. Right? It's pushing 10 o'clock, and you're still here and, you know, fielding questions and um, presenting your ideas. So thank you for um, your efforts, and uh, certainly Mrs. Emerling, Ms. San Filippo, and Dr. Hatter, uh, thank you for a very informative evening. Cheryl? Yeah, thank you to our administrators for the continued uh, budget presentations. We appreciate them. Um, at you know all of the board meetings throughout this month and and probably April, um, and also the I grant that uh, Ms. Ms. Servidio's class presented on, we got a huge bang for the buck on that one. That was really <laughs> uh, you know something that <laughs> blew us out of the water. So um, really nice job, and just continue with that going forward and going strong with the I grants. I think they're wonderful. So thank you, Ron, for finding the money to fund them. Lisa. Yeah, I'll just echo everybody else's sentiments. My, It's already 10 o'clock. My voice is going. <laughs> you guys are all sticking in. I appreciate that. Thank you for being here, Ron. Your team is amazing. Um, thank you to you and your whole team. Yeah. Um, thank you for the budget presentations. They were informative and as such. And Mr. Video, it's not just the I grant. It's the passion the teacher puts in once they get the stuff. And she did a phenomenal job. And those students knew what they were talking about. They weren't just reading. So it was she did an amazing job. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask Yvette a couple of questions. Um, so we're talking about the budget vote and the election. So can you please talk about what the process is if someone wants to run for board trustee? Talk about early mail-in voting and on the budget vote. And then if someone wants to register to vote in school board elections, how do they check or how do they register? Okay, uh, to run for the school board, uh, there's currently uh, two seats that will be up. It's Jackie Carbone and Peter Bisaccia. If you want to run for the school board, you just uh, can contact me at ysegal at yorktown.org or 914-243-8199 uh, for a petition. There's 28 signatures that are needed. The petitions are due to me um, April 22nd by 5 o'clock. Um, and um, I have on the website, the district website here, some information on running for the school board and some um, helpful uh, links that will help anyone that get, get more information on what it takes to be a school board member through Westchester Putnam School Boards Association and NISBA. Um, and then to for the early mail that you asked, um, this year that we had early mail ballots available for the bond vote. Uh, was very successful, and um, you can also obtain early mail ballot applications through me. You first have to file uh, fill out an application um, for it to obtain a ballot. So it's also similar to like the absentee. It's very similar in the sense that um, when you need a reason, and with the early mail ballots, you don't need a reason, um, and that you could contact me again. Same information for the petition. Contact me, and I will supply that to you. You have to fill out an application first to get the ballot. Once we verify you are a registered voter, I will send you the ballot. Um, you could send it to me at least seven days before the um, budget vote or uh, give it to me personally at the office. Um, and then voter registration. We offer personal registration all throughout the year from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, again, contact me and I will help you get registered. If you register with me, you can um, register with the um, New York State voter registration form, I have that available, and I also have the school budget vote and election registration, which, but that will just mean that you can only vote in a school district. Um, and the last date to register for that is May 16th, five days before the actual election. So if somebody doesn't know if they're registered, how do they check? Call me and I could check. Okay. Did I think I covered everything? All right. I hope I wasn't too And fast, everything so is on the website, correct? Everything is on the website. Um, Again, I have uh, voter information here, what it, what's, what the requirements are to be a registered voter. I have the um, voter registration and process through New York State and my information. So 
some information about absentee ballots and early mail ballots. And then, uh, again, running for the seat on the school board. Is that on the home page, like the landing page? That's on the Board of Education tab. I believe there's also a link for on the budget tab, which is on the home page as well. He connected it. Yeah. So if you go up the home page and click on budget, you're going to get to the same information as well. Right. Okay. All right. Um, we're up to public comment. Anybody? No. No. That means we're up to a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you all very much. Good night.